The average patient that we see now with secondary breast cancer, now their survival is measured in years rather than months. Sadly, the average patient will still die from the disease, but it's not at all uncommon now for patients to get five, six, seven years. I lost one lady recently who was going for nearly 20 years from the diagnosis of secondary breast cancer. I saw a patient two days ago who had a biopsies of her liver 12 years ago showing secondary breast cancer who's still alive. But I also, by the way, believe the pharma industry has been guilty of really overpricing drugs. We are amongst the wealthiest countries in the world. By, by some definitions, we are the wealthiest country in the world, okay? And we have amongst the slowest and poorest access to new cancer drugs of any developed OECD country. Now. Somebody else is going to have to explain that one to me. What is happening now is that the companies employ, you know, market psychologists, market analysts who do all kinds of calculations working. What is the maximum that we can charge for that drug? The other big area was immunotherapy. And this has been the real eye opener and a shock to all of us. People like me and others really just had never saw this one coming. Yeah, It's amazing, actually, isn't it? Uh, melanoma is of particular interest to Irish people because we have a lot of it. But there certainly is great interest right now in the whole question of intermittent fasting. It, it, I think the way we practice medicine is going to change dramatically. Not in a million years, but in the next 10 years because of information technology and artificial intelligence. Professor Crown, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here today. As a pharmacist, you, <laughs> as a pharmacist, Working in the organ for 17 years, I've seen many of your patients that you've looked after. You've done so much work in cancer care, cancer research. So I asked you to come on today and, and you did. So I'd love to know a little bit more about you, uh, your, where you came from and how you got to being the oncologist that you, you are today. Well, thank you, Lauren. Thank you for uh, inviting me on. Um, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, uh, in 1957. My, uh, my parents were Irish immigrants to the States. My father was from North Leitrim, my mother from Kildare. My dad had gone to America probably in the late 1940s. Uh, he'd come from, you know, a family that had a farm and a business in North Leitrim, and he was the second son, and he decided to strike off on his own and went to New York. He used to tell the story about arriving in Manhattan. He didn't come to Ellis Island, but he did go on a, on a ship as opposed to an airplane at the time. And, you know, armed with the address of the local man from North Leitrim who lived in the Bronx, who was the person who was the go-to guy when you arrived in New York from North Leitrim. And he'd make sure you had accommodation for a few nights and get you fixed up with a job. And, and he did. He ended up working a number of different jobs. He drove a truck for a while and then got a job as a taxi driver. I've always had a certain affinity for taxi drivers as a result. My dad spent many years as a taxi driver in New York. Uh, and he came back on his first ever holiday uh, to Ireland uh, some years later. And he was visiting with his sister, who was a nurse and midwife working in the wonderful Old Coombe Hospital in Dublin. Uh, and he was introduced to, uh, by my darling aunt, Flory, his sister, introduced to her flatmate, who, who was a, a young nurse who worked with her, who became my mother. Uh, they, as they say, struck up a romance or struck up a line, as they used to say. Uh, she went to America with him, uh, or followed him over some years later, or some months later, I should say. And they got married. Uh, and when I was born, when they were newlyweds, my dad was still driving the taxi. And he had a he had a bad accident when he was driving the taxi. And he had a severe spinal injury. Uh, luckily, did not end up with any you know paralysis or anything, although I'm, I'm told it was touch and go for a while. He spent quite a, a while in hospital, and for the rest of his life, he had back problems and had to wear back supports. But um, after that accident, he bought a little business. He bought a shop uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, ironically now, but my anti-smoking stance, it was called Jack's Cigar Store. <laughs> it was a uh, you know candy shop, sweet shop, news agents, tobacconist shop, the kind of general shop you would find. And it was, it was right beside a subway station uh, in Brooklyn. And uh, as a result, it was a good place to have a shop. And he worked extraordinarily hard. Both my parents did. My dad used to open the shop at six in the morning, close it at 11 o'clock at night. He'd have a couple of hours of a nap in the middle of the day. It was open all day, uh, Monday to Saturday, and he'd leave a little bit early on a Sunday. But it was, it, was a, it was a hard station, and he did it for many years. Um, he ultimately sold the shop, um, and we came back to Ireland. Uh, I came back in 1967. So... As a 10-year-old, 
leaving New York and coming back to Ireland. And for the first year I was back, I lived in uh, rural Ireland in my mother's hometown of Newbridge, County Kildare. Um, it was quite a substantial culture shock. Um, um, I, I can recall some of the, <laughs> some of the deprivations that felt very acute to a 10 year old were things like the television was only on for three hours a day and there was only one channel. Um, yeah. uh, there was no concept of chocolate ice cream. Pizza didn't exist. Um, and you know, you had male teachers rather than female teachers. And there, you know, I am endlessly grateful for the wonderful education I received, mainly from Irish religious orders. I do understand all the problems that occurred. Luckily, I never personally encountered any problems like that. And I've, I'd have to go on the record and say that I'm personally very grateful for the education I received from the Patrician brothers and the Christian brothers and the, and the Carmelite priests in, in turn your college over the course of my of my time, but it was a bit of a culture shock having ma male teachers who, you know, tended to be, shall we say, a little bit less genteel than female yeah. teachers were at that stage. But it was, um, it was interesting. And uh, what made you then go to college and do medicine? What was the interest there? I think one of the biggest, two of the biggest influences in the way the shape my life took were the fact that I was an only child. And the fact that my mother was a nurse, and my mother was a nurse and a very smart woman, Lord rest me, only lost her last year. She worked in nursing in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 1990s. She had a long, long nursing career, oh both in, in Ireland and in America, and she loved nursing and healthcare. She instilled a love of learning in general in me and probably also specifically got me very focused on healthcare. So I had a sort of an assumption, I must say, from a relatively early age that I would probably gravitate towards medicine. Like most little boys, I flirted with other ideas. I had a big fantasy about being an officer in the American Navy once. I've still <laughs> have a, an interest in naval matters. Um, but for, honestly, from about the age of 14, I knew I was doing medicine. That's, that's actually an interesting comment about Ireland because to pick the right leaving cert subjects, and I was a little young in my class in the Leaving Cert. Uh, I was really making that decision at about the age of 14 or 15, uh, with a view to what I would do afterwards. I We may come back to it, but I have some other thoughts about how medical education should evolve a little bit. But we, um, uh, I, I knew I was going to do it. And why cancer medicine? It wasn't that I knew some great big personal tragedy or anything. I did, I did have a very close friend as a young boy who'd lost his father to cancer. And very sadly, years later, after I'd left American was back in Ireland, we'd heard that his mother, who was very friendly with my mother, had also died very prematurely from cancer. So I was, a, I was aware of these tragedies. And there was something about cancer in America in the 60s. It was kind of a, a big ticket, sort of a big ticket scientific idea right up there, but they were going to the moon. They felt was okay. going to cure cancer, cancer research. It was, it was a big, big issue at the time. There was a lot of focus on cancer. A lot of the stories about smoking and cancer, were, which had come out in the 50s, were really getting great currency in the 60s. Um, and I, I guess I just developed an interest in the subject. And really from the time I went into medical school at the age of 17, but a, again, a brief flirtation when I thought of doing ophthalmology or eye, eye medicine, which I didn't do. Um, I probably would have been extremely bad at it. Um, Why? I, I don't think I have it in the hands okay. for that kind of fine that kind of fine <laughs> surgery. I don't think I would have. Um, but I, I, I always really knew I was going to do. And 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 at a time when most of my classmates were still very uncertain what they would do, some for various family reasons were going to follow particular areas. But I didn't. I knew I was going to do cancer medicine. Okay. Yeah. And it's, cancer medicine has come a long way since you mm. would have started. Oh wow! Wow. You know, I'm like that old guy in the cartoon. This is I'm I'm I am a medical oncologist, which is um, the type of doctor who treats cancer with drugs and medicines, as opposed to a radiation oncologist who treats cancer with radiotherapy, or a surgical oncologist who treats cancer by by operations. And and really, at the time I did medical oncology, it was it was very underdeveloped when I decided I wanted to do medical oncology rather it was very underdeveloped especially in Ireland we had one wonderful uh, heroic man practicing medical oncology uh, called Professor, Professor Jim Fenley uh, in St. Vincent so I had the great pleasure and privilege of becoming associated with professionally and indeed on a, on a personal and friendship level uh, years later uh, he was the only one in the country so uh, in fact in the hospital I was training and there was no medical oncologist I knew I wanted to be one before I'd actually met one 
Um, and at the time, cancer medicine was quite primitive. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there were a handful of cancers, like some cases of breast cancer and some cases of prostate cancer, where you were able to treat the cancer with manipulations in the body's normal hormone uh, system. Uh, for instance, it had been discovered in the latter half of the 19th century by a, a very visionary surgeon called Beetson in Glasgow that young women uh, with advanced breast cancer, the kind that was too advanced for operations, that sometimes you could make their cancer go into remission if you removed their ovaries. Uh, and this observation led to the whole development of trying to suppress female hormones for some patients with breast cancer, which could produce, you know, in some cases, wonderful results, usually more modest results and, and often didn't work at all. But it was, it was all that was available for many years. And something similar occurred with men with prostate cancer. Um, chemotherapy, the treatment of cancer with, you know, basically poisonous drugs, had a very inauspicious beginning. It really arose as an outgrowth of the um, chemical weapons uh, research, which was done uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Um, uh, it was recognized uh, really after the First World War, where chemical weapons were widely used, that chemical weapons, mainly mustard gas, had a number of other effects other than the horrible destructive effects they had on the lungs and the upper airways that they could make the blood counts go down. And a very tragic episode occurred uh, in the 1940s during the Second World War. Uh, it's an interesting little historical footnote that even though chemical weapons were famously used to horrible effect in the First World War and the Second World War was like the most destructive event in human history, chemical weapons weren't generally used in the Second World War. And it wasn't because people had gotten better. It was because they were afraid that if they were used, they'd be used back against them. Um, okay. The Italians had used uh, chemical weapons uh, in Africa prior to the formal start of the Second World War. But during the actual Second World War, there was very little use, if any, of chemical weapons. Of course, we're all aware of the the awful tragedies that occurred with gassing and the Holocaust. But as, as, a, as a weapon in the battlefield, they were not. But everybody had them in case the other side used them first. And there was a ship in the Allied Anglo-American invasion fleet in Barry Harbor in Italy uh, was bombed by the Luftwaffe, the German uh, Air Force, in the 1940s. There was a major uh, release of chemical weapons that were brought and stored on a ship called the uh, USS Harvey. And uh, this extraordinary tragedy occurred in addition to the poor men and boys who were killed and blown up because of the bombing. The, the harbor, and, and I, I had the privilege of knowing an old gentleman who was a survivor of that event, an Irishman who had served in the Merchant Navy, he used to say that harbour was like, it was like Dunleary Harbour. It had a great big wall around most of it. And the um, chemical weapons got into the harbour and they formed this cloud of mustard gas, which people that were not near the explosion suddenly became real and were poisoned. And it was discovered afterwards that their white blood cell counts went down and sometimes their spleen had shrunk. And some very clever doctors at the time said, you know, maybe, just maybe, we could use this to treat leukemia. And that was actually the very inauspicious beginning of the way chemotherapy worked. And for the next 10 or 15 years, considerable research went into finding mainly poisonous chemicals that either had been made in the lab or sometimes were found in nature, mm -hmm. uh, which could be converted into drugs. And these made actually very substantial advances in a small number of cancers, principally childhood cancers and leukemia and some blood cancers. An outgrowth of those observations which were made with respect to chemical weapons was the development of chemotherapy. Uh, some very clever doctors had, had looked at the effect of the chemical weapons uh, on some of the survivors and found that in some cases their white blood cell count went down. And of course, leukemia is a cancer of white blood cells where the white blood cell count goes too high. And, and, and attempts were made to try and harness this technology, this very primitive and brutal technology to treat leukemia and other blood cancers. And it was being described during the 1940s and especially during the 1950s that this sometimes worked in terms of providing some temporary remissions of, of some cancers. And research really became frantic in this during the 1950s, trying to develop new chemicals or to identify new chemicals, which basically were poisons. They were poisons that could be controlled 
that would kill rapidly growing cells. And because many cancers, especially blood cancers, were characterized by rapidly growing cells, you could induce a remission or a, a phase of the disease coming under control. And this really made a big impact on childhood leukemia. And by the 1960s, many children with leukemia, and what could be sadder than a child with cancer? But by the 1960s, some children with leukemia were being cured. And using basically derivative technology based on harnessing, identifying and harnessing many of these cellular poisons, there was a steady improvement in the treatment of some cancers, blood cancers, childhood cancers, during the 1960s and early 1970s. And the hope was that these drugs could also have an impact in the more common adult solid tumors. Now, the truth is they had some impact, mm -hmm. but the impact was never as big. And um, so at the time I got involved or became interested in cancer treatment, all that really existed were the hormone treatments for breast and prostate cancer and this rapidly developing field of chemotherapy, um, which was useful in some cancers but had limited impact in adult cancers. Now, there's an old phrase that says, when all you have is a hammer, everything begins to look like a nail. And all we had in those days was the hammer of chemotherapy. So we didn't really have any of the fancy schmancy new molecular treatments and immunological treatments that we now have. So it was really was a big attempt to work out, could we make all the other cancers behave like a nail that could be hit with the only thing we had, which was a hammer? And and huge amount of vast amount of research involving thousands of patients went into studies looking at the application of chemotherapy with different adult solid tumors. And in general, the results were very disappointing. There were some, some real pluses, some real advantages, but in general, it, it, it was a real limit on, on how, how, how much we were going to achieve with that approach. But this is the oncology field that I got involved in. I graduated in 1980. I did my first few years of general medical training in Dublin and also wonderful, wonderful six months in, in Guy's Hospital in London. I came back and did my first oncology job, hematology and oncology job, blood and cancers, uh, 1984 to 85 as a trainee with uh, the great uh, Professor Sean McCann and great Professor Peter Daly, who were two pioneers of, of blood cancers and cancers in general in Ireland. And, uh, you know, I learned an awful lot in that year. And then I went to New York, to Mount Sinai Hospital uh, in New York. Um, I still remember, it's very different now, going across the year before with about six or eight addresses in my pocket, no computers, no online in those days, laboriously going through books, getting the, the names of people who were directors of oncology programs in various parts of America. I decided I wanted to be in New York. And I did interviews in a number of them, but the one that really, and I can still recollect it, it's very funny, thinking at, I guess, about the age of 26, thinking how sophisticated I was going with my, my plastic attache <laughs> case with my two-page curriculum vitae and sitting in some <laughs> cafe or bar in New York, you know, no mobile phones, you know, wondering where was I going next. But I met one of the most inspirational figures in my life, Professor Dr. Jim Holland, who was one of that foundation generation of American cancer specialists. He was a man who had uh, come through the accelerated medical school programs the Americans developed during the Second World War when they wanted to get doctors qualified quickly and get them out there. And the war ended just as he was graduating. He did a number of very interesting uh, jobs during his time in the army. But at the time, the U.S. government had a really critical role in developing the field of cancer research and cancer medicine. And they set up, they had set up an, an entity called the National Cancer Institute some years before. And this really blossomed uh, in the post-war years. And Jim Holland went and worked in the National Cancer Institute in Washington uh, for quite a few years. And then they set up National Cancer Institute affiliated research centers around the country called Comprehensive Cancer Centers. And he went and headed up a, a, one of the really influential early ones in Buffalo, New York. And from there came down to Mount Sinai. So Jim had been critically involved in a, the development of many of these treatments for childhood leukemia, childhood cancer, bone cancer, and also in adult cancers and breast cancer. And he just was an inspirational figure who used to basically teach you that you could try and help every patient, but you also had to try and learn from every patient. And you had to try and make research available to every patient. And you should try and make clinical trials available to every patient. Um, and I just learned so much from him in the two years I spent in Mount Sinai. And then I moved down to a very famous cancer hospital in New York called Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, 
where I did two further years of training. Uh, and again, I was exposed to some of the most wonderfully influential, visionary leaders, people whose, you know, whose work has saved thousands of lives, hundreds of thousands, millions of lives over the years. And one of them is Dr. Larry Norton. Uh, and Dr. Norton, um, was a breast cancer specialist. I'd known him in Mount Sinai. And when he moved down to Sloan Kettering, he set up a, a new high-end research-focused breast cancer program in Sloan Kettering. And I was one of the first people he recruited. So I then worked for four years after I finished my training as a consultant in that in that uh, program. And it's so interesting to see how the field has changed because everything we were doing then was chemotherapy. We were really looking at, can we make chemotherapy better? New chemotherapy drugs, can they make things better? Can we give bigger doses of chemotherapy drugs? We really tried to capitalize on the fact that some cancers, classically breast cancer, responded a bit to chemotherapy. And our, our hope is that if we could maybe give, find a safer way of giving bigger doses, that we could get better results. And this really became the big focus of my research for probably the first decade of my research career, that and developing new chemotherapy drugs or helping to develop them clinically. Can I just ask you, when you're talking about research, you're also treating patients and using them as research as well and the clinical trials. So it's all mixed up together, isn't that right? It's not just you go off and do research and you're in a lab. It's all part and parcel of working with patients. That's exactly right. I, I, I did lab work in Sloan Kettering and had some publications from that, but my research has been clinical research really since that. Uh, even the lab research I was doing was looking at some drugs uh, which we were using to try and ameliorate some of the serious life-threatening side effects of chemotherapy in an attempt to give bigger doses of chemotherapy. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, as a researcher, my career has been as a clinical researcher, and we'll, we'll come to it in a while, but that changed a bit in, in recent years. But uh, as I was saying, for that first decade of my life, it was really all about chemotherapy trials. It was trying to develop, how, in, to sort of introduce newer drugs that were coming out of the labs into clinical trials, working out how we could give them alone or in combination, what doses we could give. Could we give them together with things like bone marrow transplants we were doing, where we would take some of the patient's bone marrow out, give them a very big dose of chemotherapy and give the bone marrow back to them afterwards. That was a way of getting around the fact that chemotherapy could poison your bone marrow so completely it would never recover. But if we could take some away and freeze it, give the chemo, wait till the chemotherapy had left the person and give the bone marrow back, that you could then get recovery of their own bone marrow, recovery of their blood, and in the process have given a much bigger dose of chemotherapy. Now that worked quite well for some cancers. It didn't work as well in breast cancer as we hoped it would, although it, it did seem to work a little bit better, but uh, events caught up with us. Meanwhile, my ambition the whole time I was in the States was to get a job back in Ireland. I mean, I was acutely conscious of how few oncology jobs there had been. By the time I was looking at coming back. There were three oncologists working in Ireland, Professor Fenley, Professor Daly, who we mentioned, and another very, uh, very prominent and uh, wonderful man, uh, Professor Desmond Carney in the matter. And uh, Des had come back to Ireland some years before with a colossal reputation in America as one of the brightest, best young cancer researchers and clinicians in oncology in the States. Uh, and he came back to Ireland and set up a great unit in the matter. But still, there were only three people. They were all in Dublin. There was no, there were some very good hematology doctors who were also practicing oncology on the side, and there were some in the private sector. But cancer medicine was woefully underdeveloped. When I came back in 1993, Professor Fendi and I worked in Vincent's. We were the only hospital that had two oncologists. And that gave us a little bit of flexibility to try and, I mean, good Lord, two, two sounds so, so understaffed. Goodness, it really does, yeah. doesn't it? Um, well, I used to joke that I was often in the elevator in Sloan Kettering in New York with more Irish oncologists than there were in Ireland, uh, which is true. And I certainly had been in Eamon Doran's bar on a few occasions, but far more Irish oncologists than yeah. there had been in, than there had been in New York. That had been in Ireland at the time. But uh, we came, I came back in 93 um, and said about really my big ambition professionally, in addition to practicing a vast scale of medicine involving numbers of patients I could never have dreamt of before because there were so few of us. And by the way, for the first five years I was back, I was also doing general medicine, which meant that anything that came in through Vincent's emergency department one night in six heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, et cetera, were being admitted by my oncology team and we had to look after them as well. Did you sleep? 
I did, but I, I was like a poster shot for having a really bad work-life balance. I okay. mean, I certainly was. And at, and what I really wanted to do more than anything was to set up the clinical research. So we put a big effort into setting up clinical research in Vincent's, which Professor Fenley had started and it really had, considering the restrictions placed on him as a single-handed person running a really busy service had, you know, had actually, to his credit, started it. But we developed it in a very big way. Uh, and I was fortunate over the years to see that unit grow. We now have uh, 11 people working in clinical research support uh, in St. Vincent's, and we put quite a few patients on trials. There, there have been some years for some trials where we were one of the leading recruiting centers in the world on some trials we put patients on. But something else that I'm particularly proud of is we set up the Irish Clinical Oncology Research Group, or ICORG. Uh, Ireland, uniquely in Western Europe, did not have a national clinical trials group where doctors, specialists from numbers of hospitals could come together to do collective trials, which, you know, you really could not do in an individual center. Uh, and that that became really quite successful. We put ultimately uh, some major changes occurred in that organization some 10 years later. But by the time, after its first decade, we'd put something like 6,000 Irish patients on trials. And we'd gone from a stage where nobody had heard of Ireland in clinical trials to being a stage where we were actually leading some clinical trials and Irish presenters were making presentations on the podia of major meetings. So I'm very proud of that. I think if I would like to be remembered for anything professionally, it would probably be that. But the field of oncology itself underwent a colossal change uh, in the late 1990s. Two things happened. First of all, the culmination of everything we were trying to do with chemotherapy were the high-dose chemotherapy trials, the ones we talked about where we would take some bone marrow or some blood cells from the patient, freeze them away in the lab, give a really big dose of chemotherapy, much bigger than you could give in routine practice because the side effects on the patient's bone marrow and blood would be so profound that they would never recover. Mm -hmm. But by storing their bone marrow away, giving them the treatment, and giving the bone marrow back, we could give eight, 10, 12 times the dose of chemotherapy. And the hope is that a cancer cell that would perhaps, or a cancer that perhaps would go into some degree of remission with an ordinary dose might be cured if you gave the bigger dose. So what, what happened in the end of the 1990s were a number of clinical trials came out, one of which I was a chair, chairman of, which basically showed that it wasn't a whole lot better than conventional chemotherapy, which, you know, was a big downer. We were all very disappointed at this. But meanwhile, the good news was that the years, the 20, 30, 40 years of research, which had gone into lab research in cancer, trying to you know, develop a better understanding of what made cancer cells different to normal cells, how you could exploit that with targeted drugs, which only hit the cancer and didn't necessarily hit the rest of the person with chemotherapy style side effects, that began to pay off. And we'd been involved in a little way with that in the 1990s. There was a particular drug called Herceptin, which was a new breast cancer drug developed by uh, a simply extraordinary man, Dr. Dennis Slayman from University of California in Los Angeles, um, the son of Syrian immigrants, uh, the son of a coal miner from Western Pennsylvania, whose early brilliance was recognized with multiple scholarships to fine institutions of learning where he did an MD and a PhD, subsequently moved from Chicago where he had been studying medicine to Los Angeles where he began his cancer training and cancer research. And at an absurdly young age, had papers and publications in the leading journals. One of these underachievers then, yeah? Oh, absolutely <laughs> underachiever, yeah. And he, he had made an observation. He was at a lecture once where a man called uh, Dr. Weinberg from, from Boston was giving a lecture in Los Angeles about a new gene that he had noticed in some cancers called the HER2 gene. And uh, Dennis Slayman said, you know what? He said, I've got a lot of, I've been freezing away a lot of cancer tissue for a few years now. Why don't I study that gene and these cancers and see what it, what it means? And he found that some of the cancers, about 20% of them had an abnormality in that HER2 gene. And then when he went and looked at the records of the patients that those cancers came from, it hit him in a flash. These were worse cancers. These were really bad cancers. The patients who had that alteration in that gene had amongst the most aggressive breast cancers imaginable. They had a much higher rate of the cancer spreading and it occurred much more quickly. So he then started on what became a life's work of trying to understand that phenomenon and what's more, trying to develop treatments for it. And... Um, in collaboration with some scientific colleagues who worked for a company called Genentech, that was one of those classic California startups. I think it 
probably started in somebody's garage and suddenly grew to become a great company. They worked out how to develop specific antibodies, which just targeted HER2. That abnormal gene, which in about 20% of cancers, made the breast cancer much more aggressive. And clinical trials were started. And lo and behold, they were seeing some patients without chemotherapy side effects, with a totally different kind of treatment, the cancer was starting to, to shrink. And they developed this quickly, uh, and then they started a large-scale international trial. And we in St. Vincent's put, we managed to get one Irish patient on, on that trial. Uh, we had at the time, I remember, there was a real cultural problem in Ireland trying to persuade people that doing research on patients who were dying of cancer was an ethical thing to do. And of course it was an ethical thing to do. How else were we going to make advances? So we succeeded in getting one patient on that study, which became one of the most widely quoted studies in the history of medicine. Unfortunately, one patient wasn't enough to get me a co-authorship, but anyway, <laughs> we've learned to cope with that disappointment. But over the next few years, I started working very closely with Dr. Slayman. I had one extraordinary experience. So I'd, I'd met him briefly in Dublin. He'd come to Dublin and given us a seminar, and I just found him the most amazingly impressive man. But I found myself on my way to a meeting of the European Society of Medical Oncology and who was sitting beside me on this four hour flight to Athens, but Dr. Slayman. And we had just had all that bad news about the high dose chemotherapy bone marrow transplant trials. And I was feeling as if this is it, my research career is at an end, my one big idea is gone. Um, and I had the privilege of having over the course of this three and a half or four hour flight, a personal one-on-one -on -one tutorial, like a grind and cancer biology from the world doyen of cancer biology. And by the end of it, that's it. I said, I knew my new direction. He and I started a collaboration, which has thankfully continued to this day. He's been a wonderful friend to Ireland, to Irish patients, uh, Irish cancer patients, to education and teaching in Ireland. He's been a wonderful friend to cancer and medicine in Ireland, to Irish cancer patients, uh, uh, for our young scientists going and training in this lab. And indeed, I'm so pleased that he was rewarded with a President of Ireland Award for outstanding service to Ireland several years ago, and he really deserved that. But he and I started collaborating, and I became involved with his international research group, and uh, which ultimately, uh, it's it's hilarious to think, well, it's not hilarious, but it's, it's interesting to think that, you know, pr from progressing to the stage where we put one patient on the trial, to thankfully, I was very fortunate, mainly due to the efforts of so many of my Irish collaborators, who at this stage were somewhat more numerous, and we had a better structure set up through the Irish Clinical Oncology Research Group that by the time we did the major international study on Herceptin, Dr. Dennis Lane and I were the two co-chairs of that trial. Uh, and again, that probably was the, the high point of my clinical research career. And I'm glad that I had some little, some little role in, in helping to advance that treatment, which is now uh, widely used around the world. But honestly, if that man doesn't win the Nobel Prize, there is something wrong with the yeah. Nobel Prize. He, he just is contribution has been colossal. And and in the next 10 years after that, he's been involved in a whole different area of breast cancer research, helping to develop a group of drugs called, it's without sounding too technical, the CDK4-6 inhibitors. These are tablet drugs which are used for a different kind of breast cancer, which have also had a very important role in improving the outcome for patients with, with, those, with that disease. Was it difficult to get the Herceptin approved over here you, we always hear stories about Ireland's always the last, the last man to get the, you know, these novel products. Did you find it difficult to get them? We are amongst the last to get them now. We weren't then. And I have to say this, and it will sound provocative, but back, back in those days, we actually had a much more liberal regime for getting drug approvals than the UK had. In fact, I had some, I had some uh, cancer refugees people from the UK National Health Service who could not get Herceptin at the time in the UK were coming to Ireland every week, every three weeks to get it. Uh, okay. uh, we at the time had quite a liberal regime and I, I hate to say this because I've kind of gone past the stage in my life when I like picking fights. I've, I've made enough enemies at this stage. But it was as if there were folks in the bureaucracy here that said, why, you know, we, we love copying the British and everything in their health service. We, we also need to copy their rationing system for drugs. What we have here is, they used to describe it as a free for all in the Wild West. It wasn't. We use drugs well. We use them wisely. We use them in accordance with data. 
We used them in accordance with international precedents, but we didn't use them the way the British would have used them, because Britain at the time was notoriously the most conservative of the major countries, and indeed of most countries in the world, in terms of cancer drug approval. They, they set the highest bars for cancer drugs to be approved. Now, as it happened, there was such colossal outcry in the UK over this, and I mean really up to the level of you know parliamentary debates, that the British liberalized that considerably in recent years, and they're not n now not too bad. But sadly, we are uh, amongst the slowest to approve new drugs. Now, Laura, I completely understand there is a context, a social and economic context to every penny that one of us spends on cancer drugs. I understand that. There's so much money to go around, and there were children with you know, spinal surgery, children who need spinal surgery. There were people who need hip replacements. There were people waiting for hearing. I, I, I get that. It's not just cancer medicine, not just cancer drugs. But these are two facts. This, this is a circle which I'm having trouble squaring, okay? We are amongst the wealthiest countries in the world. By, by some definitions, we are the wealthiest country in the world, okay? And we have amongst the poorest access to new, the slowest and poorest access to new cancer drugs of any developed OECD country. Now, somebody else is going to have to explain that one to me because I don't quite understand it. I mean, I, I do know that there has to be a health technology assessment. There has to be a value for money assessment. I do get all of that. And I also, by the way, believe the pharma industry has been guilty of really overpricing drugs. Back in the old days, the way drugs were priced was you worked out how much it cost to develop the drug, how much it cost to develop all the drugs that failed, okay? Mm -hmm. And you charge that cost plus an appropriate markup to give the company a profit. What is happening now is that the companies employ, you know, market psychologists, market analysts who do all kinds of calculations working. What is the maximum that we can charge for that drug? Okay, what's the maximum we can charge with that drug that people will pay? As, as economists would say, the point when it becomes elastic, when the demand will go down because the price is too high. Uh, and as a result, we have some extraordinarily expensive drugs, which I know were not that expensive to develop and not that expensive to manufacture. And what's more, another really annoying thing is some really old drugs that had all their development 30 and in some cases 40 years ago are now now have extortionate prices attached to them because monopolies have emerged in terms of companies losing interest in manufacturing them. A smaller number of companies are making them, so monopolistic prices have developed. So there really is a problem. And my own solution would be, I, I do think, and I, I suggested this some time ago, and in fact, Simon Harris, when he was Minister for Health, seemed to pick up on the idea and said something about it himself, that you know the, the major com countries need to get, get together and form purchasing cartels and just tell the companies, no, th this is too much. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some drugs which are so expensive to develop and so complicated to manufacture that you kind of get it, mm -hmm. okay? But the others which really were not that hard. They're very cheap to make. Uh, and oh, sure I know. the proof for that is how cheap <laughs> the generics are. Absolutely, you know? yeah. By, by the way, a quick advertising point. Don't be afraid to use generics. Oh, I yeah. take a generic tablet. <laughs> I always tell my patients, do not be afraid to take generic medications. I'm not really aware of any circumstance in oncology where there's a problem with generic medications. And, and it's something we do need to do. And are you speaking about biosimilars there as well when it comes to the, the high-tech drugs? The biosimilars that are are made for them too. They in general, I would be in favour. I, I, I'm I, I'm aware of perhaps one. There was one precedent where there had been a question mark about a biosimilar and a side effect. But in in general, um, the big one for me now is is what we used to call Herceptin. The proper name for Herceptin is Trastuzumab, and, and there are generic uh, versions of that drug which I'm delighted are available and which have the potential to save so much money and in the process make treatments available to so many other patients and i'm sorry i could i i'm sitting here uh, uh, talking to you and I, I don't want to use you as my freudian analyst so if i start free associating here forgive me that's okay but <laughs> when you consider on a more global scale okay so we're, we're worried about being able to get expensive cancer drugs for patients there are so many places in the world where you can't get an operation you can't have an anesthetic. Uh, you can't get examined by a doctor. I mean, we have, if we are really going to try and deploy the colossal improvements which have been made in cancer treatment on a global scale, 
we have to work out ways to make all of the stuff much cheaper. Yeah, we really do, don't we? Mm. And I would have thought with the European Union and the buying power that it has, that there would have been some improvement in this, but there really hasn't been. And it's only gone the other way, really, hasn't it? Well, what's happened is that, and people don't quite get this sometimes, the drug approval process is done at European level, okay? That's like what in America would be called the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, their function is to prove that we are happy that the drug works and is safe, okay, or, or meets an appropriate standard for efficacy and safety. They don't decide anything to do with pricing. They just say, yeah, this, 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 they've done enough work in this drug, it should be, they should be allowed to sell this drug. And in Europe, that's done by a group called the European Medicines Agency, uh, which is a very good body. It does very good work. Um, however, in Europe, decisions about reimbursement are left to individual countries. And that is why we have the disparity in drug access from country to country. Because diff the, the EU, you know, the, the compromises which are necessary, and I, I, I don't want to sound provocative when I say a federal entity, be, but, you know, it is a sort of a federal entity. We're not, we're not one country. In some ways, the EU does behave as if it's one country. In some ways, it behaves as if it's, you know, it's constituent parts. But one of the, you know, areas of independence that has been left to countries with drug pricing uh, and decisions as to whether the drug would or would not be purchased. So what happens in Ireland now is, the the EMA makes a decision that the drug is to be approved, okay? If the drug is approved, it is then up to individual country to decide if they will pay for it. And the individual health systems and insurers then strike various deals with the companies, you know, to try and work out the best price. And we don't know because that process is fairly opaque, but we have we certainly know that there are big disparities between what are paid in Europe and in North America. And in general, North Americans pay much more for the same drugs than people outside North America, but especially outside the United States. So in Ireland, the drug is then submitted to the National Center for Pharmaco no, Pharmacoeconomics, where there's a thing called a health technology assessment, which is basically a workout, crudely put, uh, how much does it cost to save one year of life? And, and the figure for that then varies around a certain number of tens of thousands of, of euro. And if, if it meets the criteria, it may well be approved. And if it does not, it won't. In Ireland, a further semi-formal step occurs. Even there have been situations where the NCPE, the National Center for Pharmacoeconomics, has said, yes, this, this drug is good enough value. It should be reimbursed. It should be bought. The decision is then up to the HSE if they will actually buy it because they have to say, can we afford it? Uh, and that has slowed up some cancer drugs by an additional year or two over the years where it had passed health technology assessment, but the HSE had slowed it down. Now, Again, as I said earlier, we are a rich country. We are a very rich country, but, but there's no criterion by which we are not a very wealthy country, okay? We may be the richest country in the world by some criteria, which may be somewhat inflated by foreign direct investment, parking of, you know, international funds here, etc. Um, but we are quite wealthy. But in terms of our drug approvals, we are slow. Now, I hate to say this, but for the first time, I've always been a great advocate of equality of access between public and private systems in Ireland. In fact, hopefully we get to talk about that later, but I'd like to see a single system. Um, we now have a disparity in access of cancer drugs between the public and the private, which is very distressing. There are some treatments which are available to patients who are insured with voluntary health insurance, which are not available to patients in the public system. Uh, and and I, I, while I'm sure there are some in the public system who would say that's the fault of the VHI, I would say no. The VHI is a not-for-profit arm of the government. It is not a private insurance company. It has one shareholder, who's the Minister for Health. It doesn't have, you know, folks that are taking money out of it. All the money that they make covers their costs and is reinvested to cover future costs. It is social insurance. We call it private insurance. It's not. It's very similar to what the Canadians call social insurance or what the Germans would call social insurance. But they are providing a better product in terms of access to cancer drugs than the other part of the public service, which is the HSE. Um, now, so there's a difference between the VHI and Leia and insurers like that. Is that right? There is, and you're reading my mind because I was just coming to that. <laughs> Sorry. So we have other insurers in the market in Ireland that are private insurers. So historically, what happened was that the health technology assessment, the cost assessment, made by the National Center for Pharmacoeconomics was used as a precedent by the private insurers as well. 
Okay. They say, oh, not approved by the NCP. We're not going to pay for it either. And we used to kind of through gritted teeth say, well, that's different. Their writ runs in the HSE system. It doesn't run in your system. You should be following the dictates of the European Medicines Agency, which says the drug should be approved. So get to work fixing a price with the companies and make the drug available to your members in the case of VHI or your customers in the case of the private insurers. Um, and the VHI have broken ranks with, on this in the last couple of years, and they are now on a selective case-by-case -case application basis reimbursing drugs that are European Medicines Agency approved, but not as yet approved in the public system in Ireland. This was a colossal change. Um, and uh, it has had real practical implications. There were some really important cancer treatments and drugs, which we now which we can now get for VHI insured patients that we cannot get for patients in the public system. And uh, another little gap has emerged as well now because the private insurers are still following the old model of if the NCPE slash HSE approve it, we'll pay for it. And if they don't, we won't. So there now is a gap opening between what the VHI are offering insured patients and what other companies Everyone's going to be everyone's going to be rushing now to to get to get to VHI. That's terrible. Uh, I'm isn't not it? saying people should do that, no, but I do but think when people are making the decision, and there may well be advantages for one company over another. I don't know, but I can tell you one thing: there is absolutely no doubt about. As we say this on April twenty fourth, twenty twenty three, this day there is a definite, discernible, very real, and potentially important gap in access to cancer drugs in favour of VHI compared to the private insurers. Goodness. It's it, it's terrible to think that though, isn't it? Even in terms of that there's there's the difference, that disparity between mm. the private and pub public care. Are Ireland paying more for drugs than the likes of the UK because of our small catchment area? Is I, I don't know. Is the, I suspect that is not the case. But uh, again, there's a great opaqueness about the negotiations which take place between the purchasing agencies here and and the company and the manufacturers. So it doesn't make sense that there would be opaqueness, though. Does there really? If we were uh, to go on a European wide level, hmm. surely everything everyone would benefit from it. I, I, well, I, I think that, but I mean, I I, 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 I would prefer if it was that way. But I, I, I can kind of understand why it does happen because it's it's the way they negotiate. The, you know, each side has a negotiating position. The the government's. The insurance company's position is they're trying to pay as little as possible and they're trying to hang as tough as they can. And on the other hand, the companies are trying to get as much money as they can. And they're also afraid that if I set a precedent, if they get a particularly good deal for one country, that somebody in some other country might say, hey, why are we paying more? So I presume, I, pres I, I don't have any inside knowledge in that, but I mean, it makes sense to me that that's why it, it occurs the way it does. I would much prefer if decisions, and in fact, uh, I served for a time in Shannon Aaron. And when I was in Shannon Aaron, I proposed a bill. I, I, it was proposed, it was originally proposed by somebody else, but I, I allowed myself to be uh, affiliated with the bill as a co sponsor. And I also made some important changes in, in what the bill was about. And it was to do with access to cancer drugs. And um, the original politician who was proposing the bill basically said every drug should just be paid for. And I said, well, you can't do that. I mean, there has to be an assessment. We have to understand that there's a limited part of money for all healthcare. And, you know, you have, you have to put some thought into how it will be paid. But I said, what I do think we should do is that there should be a decision that if the drug has been approved at European level, that the default position for Ireland is that drug will be provided. And you allow the government and the minister you know, you give them the wriggle room that say, no, we're being asked an extortionate price. We just can't afford it. That he he or she can say no, but must go on the record that he or she's name is attached to it. That the minister would say, I'm not making drug X available because we need to get a better price for it because we can't afford it because the money spent on drug X is not available for treatment of a whole lot of other needs in the health and social service. That was thrown out, needless to say, as most backbench uh, independent uh, legislative attempts were. And, and of course, there was the usual, uh, you know, attack on the motivation of the people who were doing it. But anyway, it didn't happen. Uh, I would love if we had a uniform policy across the EU. You know, if the Germans can get access to a drug, why can't the Irish? Mm -hmm. If the Luxembourgois can get access to a drug, why can't we? You know, uh, and uh, I, I would like to see some serious... Uh, I, don't get me wrong. I, I'm, I'm not getting into this, you know, 
bashing the health economists. I mean, they have a tough job to do. They, they, they've given themselves certain criteria. Um, and I understand why they're there. But, but the reality is that we're a rich country and we have slow approvals for new drugs. Yeah. Can I ask you your thoughts on the, the price and, and the cost of cancer care and the motivation behind using these really expensive drugs in patients that some might say are going to die anyway? Uh, <clears throat> there's a book by a man called Atwal Gandhi and he discuss, he's a doctor himself and he discusses his father getting ill and being pumped full of medicines and his his last few months being horrific because of the side effects. And why did we do this? It was so costly. Everyone's scrambling around him, trying to, you know, pump him, give him, you know, an extra few months of life. Is it worth it in the long run, I, you know, financially and economically for a country and then also for the patient and their family? Can we have a little chat about that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, I mean, so there are two different situations. One of them is the patient who's got an early stage and potentially curable cancer who may have had surgery or is planned to have surgery and in whom the drugs have been shown to make an appreciable difference to their outcome, to decrease the chance that they will actually find themselves with an illness which is bringing them close to death. And a whole set of criteria used in making those decisions are very different to the criteria we would use for somebody who, who will die of their cancer regardless of the treatment. Uh, and historically, I, I don't want to speak to the specifics of Dr. Gawande's family history or what, what drugs were involved, but when we only had chemotherapy, I can tell you, we had a lot of patients who I think were getting side effects for really potentially small benefits. Uh, and, you know, I like to think that we were good enough and kind enough and wise enough and humane enough to have the discussion with patients and say, maybe you shouldn't take this. The chance that this will be helpful is small. And, you know, uh, it may be that you have a certain amount of time left to live and, and maybe that time would be better spent not being medicalized with frequent visits to hospital for treatment or for side effects of treatment and instead being at home with, you know, good quality, end of life, hospice, palliative care. And I send many, I, I get our wonderful palliative colleagues involved at a very early stage in the management of our, of our patients with advanced cancer. Um, we sometimes got it wrong. I mean, I, I've, I've no doubt about that. And another fact that you have to remember is it's, there are a lot of, there's a lot of research on this. If you ask people, if you have a serious cancer problem, do you want a treatment which gives you a 1% chance of doing better? Many patients will say yes. I mean, that's, that's the reality. You'll often put the facts to a patient and say, this really will have modest impact on your survival. It may give you side effects. I want it. You know? So it, it isn't as simple as it's sometimes portrayed. The big change in all of this has been the phenomenal change in cancer treatments. We hinted earlier on about the development of targeted treatments like Herceptin. There have been two major developments in general. The advances in cancer treatment have fallen into two two categories. One is what we call targeted treatments. And to put it bluntly, if chemotherapy was a blunderbuss, targeted therapy is a smart bomb. Okay. Targeted therapies are treatments which uh, are designed to focus on identified weaknesses in the cancer cell. Okay. You study the cancer, you grow the cells in a dish, you do all the work, you do all the molecular analysis, you find bang, that gene or that protein, or that, that that's something the cancer has that the normal cell does not have. And is this on an individualized patient basis? No. Or, this, okay. uh, no. It, it, good question. We're coming to that. But in general, you know, it was discovered the, 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 two, the two best examples I can think of were the HER2 story and the story of chronic myeloid leukemia. The HER2 story, as we mentioned earlier, we're talking about Dr. Slayman. About 20% of patients have an abnormality in a gene called the HER2 gene. Now, everybody in the world has the HER2 gene in every cell in their body. It's a normal gene to have. But as part of the, the process of anarchy that hits cancer cells, their lack of control, the, the craziness that descends on the behavior of cancer cells compared to normal cells, about 20% of the time, the HER2 gene is abnormal. And that gives you a specific target that you can target with drugs that hit the HER2 gene. And this has been a phenomenally fruitful area of research over the years. And it's inspired us looking for similar targets and other kinds of cancers. And there are now similar targets available for multiple other cancers. And that kind of targeted therapy 
uh, has revolutionized the treatment of that kind of breast cancer. Another important kind of breast cancer called estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, uh, some kinds of bowel and colon cancer, kidney cancer, uh, some patients with lung cancer. These are all these are all diseases now where very targeted treatments, not just chemotherapy, is available to attack specific vulnerabilities that the cancer cell has. The most spectacular example of all is also one of the best stories of all. There's a horrible disease called chronic myeloid leukemia. Now, when I was a hematology registrar in James's back in the 1980s. I used to hate that disease more than anything because you would have patients coming in who were really healthy. They looked fine. They had maybe an insurance exam or maybe a checkup with their GP who noticed that they had an abnormally high white blood cell count. And then when they were studied, you found that they had this thing called chronic myeloid leukemia. And with chronic myeloid leukemia, the story was grim and absolutely predictable. You would have one or two or maybe three years of relatively good health when your white cell count was a bit too high, tablets could get it back down again, and then bang, after two to three years, everything just went wrong. The disease developed this accelerated phase, which used to be called, in some cases, a blast crisis, which is a very frightening term. We tried not to use opposite patients. And once you got that, with the rarest of exceptions, with the rarest of exceptions, you would die. Um, Bone marrow transplantation, you know, using somebody else's bone marrow transplanted into you could have cured a small number of patients with it, but at the cost of very severe side effects. And it was a treatment which was not widely applicable. You had to have a suitable donor and you had to be strong enough to go through the rigors of the treatment. So in general, this disease was a death sentence. And it was known for many years that there was one quirk in that disease, a thing called the Philadelphia chromosome, because it was discovered in Philadelphia, which is where the bits of two chromosomes, which are the parts of your cell where the DNA lives. You can see when you look at a micro, special kind of a microscope, that instead of the normal array of chromosomes, a bit of one chromosome got stuck onto another one. And it was called the Philadelphia chromosome. And if you had that, you had CML, chronic myeloid leukemia. And they started working out what happened as a result of that chromosome. And they discovered that there was a very specific molecular thing that happened. A bit of the DNA from one chromosome got stuck onto the DNA of the other chromosome, but it made an abnormal DNA. And they then set about trying to develop a drug that would hit that the product of that DNA and attack the cancer. And the ultimate drug was called STI-571. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, signal transduction inhibitor, which was the kind of drugs they were, 571. It was the 571st molecule they tried before they got one that worked, okay? And that drug became a drug called Gleevec or imatinib, which mm. overnight changed that disease. People that were looking at uniform death sentences, suddenly you put them in a course of tablets, their bone marrow cleared up, everything got better. And many of those original patients from that original trial more than 20 years ago are still alive. And there are now new generations of drugs based on the same model, which are producing phenomenal results. I, I would never trivialize having CML, but it's a disease that the people live nearly normal lives with. Um, so the big hope is that after Herceptin for breast and after that, that we'd see drugs like this for multiple other disease. And we, we, ha we are seeing some, maybe not quite as spectacular as that. There are some, there are, I mean, some uncommon uh, molecular weaknesses that some cancer cells have that are spectacularly drugged with some of the new tablets. Um, and I, I must say, it's just great to see how that, that has advanced. The other big area was immunotherapy. And this has been the real eye-opener and a shock to all of us. People like me and others really just had never saw this one coming. Yeah, It's amazing, actually, isn't it? Uh, we, we always knew that the immune system had some role in cancer, okay? How we knew this was when we had bad immunotherapies, you'd occasionally get a spectacular result. Somebody would get cured. And it's actually interesting to note that the first serious attempt at immunotherapy was made about 120 years ago by a surgeon in Sloan Kettering in New York called Coley, uh, William Coley, I think. And Coley had the great idea of taking blood from patients that had serious infections like diphtheria, heating the blood to kill the germs, and then injecting it into cancer patients. And the theory was that this would stimulate the immune system to fighting the cancer. And some patients got remissions of this. Coley's toxin, it was called. 
Um, but it was the first and hint. What was the thought behind it could stimulate the nervous system? Because the, whole, it world, the whole world was big on vaccines at the time. Okay. You know, VASC vaccines had come out. They'd had, you know, a smallpox vaccine, all of these things. People were really interested in, in, in vaccines, you know. So that, that was the idea. And some patients did get bits of remission. And then over the years, some fairly primitive immune therapies were developed. BCG, which we all used to get in Ireland for prevention of TB, that, that could induce some remissions in some cases of cancer. Um, and then in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, research identified drugs like interferon, and interferon could induce some remissions in some cancers. In the 1980s, a drug called interleukin-2 was discovered, which produced some really good results uh, in a small number of patients with a small number of cancers. And the feeling really was, this is about as good as it's going to get. And, and why is that? We felt that the immune system had been, had evolved or been designed by God, whatever you want to believe in, with a specific task. And that task was dealing with foreign invaders, germs. Okay. The immune system is very good at recognizing something that was me from something that wasn't me, a germ, and dealing with that. The difference in cancer, of course, is cancer is not a foreign invader. Cancer is our own cells going rogue. So the sense was, well, the reason the immune system doesn't do a better job with cancer is it was never designed to do that. Never designed to do it. And in fact, we were spectacularly wrong. The immune system is well capable, in many cases, of recognizing cancer as being abnormal and attempting to attack it. So why doesn't it do a better job? Why doesn't the immune system just eradicate? Why do we have cancer? Why wouldn't the immune system just deal with it all the time? And the reason is that there were natural restraints called checkpoints built into the immune system. And the checkpoints are there for a reason. If we didn't have the checkpoints, the immune system would go rogue. More patients would have immune system diseases that have rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, ulcerative colitis, dermatitis, all of these diseases where the immune system misbehaves and attacks normal tissues. And, and to put it somewhat simplistically, the immune system is programmed to recognize if something is becoming too inflamed, okay? Too much, immu too much immunotherapy going on there, back off. And it backs off the immune system, okay? Mm -hmm. But what the immune system is not good at is telling the difference between a tissue which is just too inflamed and a tissue which is cancer. So for that reason, those natural checkpoints, those blocks which are built into the immune system, have the paradoxical effect of protecting cancers. And this discovery was made by some uh, wonderful scientists. Um, and the thing which really just turned the field upside down was the discovery of, of these checkpoints and the discovery that you could drug the checkpoints. Uh, and two Wonderful researchers, Dr. Hanjo and Dr. Allison, won the Nobel Prize for this a few years ago. They made the discovery that the checkpoints could be turned off. And when you turn off the checkpoints, you fire up the immune system and you make it a much better cancer-fighting apparatus than it would be otherwise. And this and is this what um, immunotherapy is? Yes, this is the new immunotherapy is yeah. now based on what, what are called immune checkpoint inhibitors. Now, there are some other even newer things coming along as well, but the immune checkpoint inhibitors look particularly, well, they, they are, they're gone past the stage of being promising. They've, pro they've delivered on the promise. Um, there were always a few cancers where even when we had bad immunotherapy, you'd see the results concentrated in those. And one was melanoma, uh, sometimes in kidney cancer. These were cancers where it was just always known the immune, immune treatments were going to work a bit there. So unsurprisingly, when the new immune treatments came out, they worked really well in those. And in melanoma in particular, um, uh, we saw amazing results. Melanoma is of particular interest to Irish people because we have a lot of it. Uh, melanoma is the most, uh, the most potentially deadly of the three major kinds of skin cancer. It's less common than the more typical two kinds of skin cancer, but uh, the chance of it misbehaving are very high. Now, I need to put in a bit of a public health message at this stage. Most patients with melanoma get cured. You go to your doctor, you go to a dermatologist, you get it removed early, you get cured. Now, that's The majority of patients will do that. But in some cases, the disease spreads. And if it spreads, the outcome historically has been terrible. That These patients with spread melanoma, with the rarest of exceptions, would die. Uh, and even when we had bad immune treatments, some of them, an occasional one would get a great result. But when the new immune treatments, the checkpoint inhibitors came on stream, 
they had a colossal impact in melanoma. So that when we see a new patient now who has a spread melanoma to other parts of their body, it has spread to their lungs, to their liver, to their bone, even to their brain, to places which historically have been a, a death sentence, they now have a fighting chance of beating it. Now, sadly, it's not 100%, but it's a whole lot better than it was. And in addition, we now know that for many of these patients, if you give the uh, treatments at an earlier stage, um, that you can decrease the chance that they will develop uh, that spread, uh, that more spread version of the melanoma as well. And these Im immunotherapies need to be used lifelong, isn't that right? No. The immune okay. therapies, typically if you're giving it as a course to somebody who's had a melanoma, but we'll say heavy lymph node involvement, uh, where there's a high risk of it coming back, it's, it's a one-year course. And for patients where the disease has actually spread... Uh, it varies, but uh, the kind of rule of thumb is around about two years. But I, I do know many of my colleagues that are major international experts in melanoma, if the disease really is in a very solid remission, will stop the treatment before uh, before two years. Um, but for melanoma, kidney cancer, bladder cancer, major, these, these are all cancers where some kind of immunotherapy used to have some effect before. But the real shock to me has been lung cancer. Uh, lung cancer uh, is quite sensitive to immune therapy. Uh, for patients with advanced secondary lung cancer, people who sadly you know, will die of the disease, using immunotherapy produces a modest but meaningful average prolongation of their survival. But importantly, a minority of those patients get a fantastic result, maybe somewhere in the 10 to 20% range, get long-term disease-free control. And we're all kind of biting our nails a little bit at this stage, wondering as with the follow-up, we're we actually seeing some of these patients being cured. And a really interesting application of this treatment, and one with an interesting Irish angle, uh, one of the brilliant generation of young Irish cancer specialists, Patrick Ford, who's in Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, uh, has led the charge on this giving the drugs, the immune therapy drugs, to patients whose cancer is earlier stage before they have an operation. And it looks like that is producing really substantially better results for some patients with high-risk lung cancer than just doing the operation alone. And is uh, that because it shrinks the tumors? It shrinks or? and it also... You're, you're getting me into kind of an interesting area here. One of the... <clears throat> one of the conundra uh, of immune therapy has been <clears throat> if you have somebody with a cancer that could be removed but has a high risk of recurring and you give them immunotherapy it will often decrease the risk the cancer will come back but it was always suggested that maybe if you gave it beforehand when the cancer was still there it would make the immune therapy work better and why is that because the immune therapy re-educates the body's immune system and how to deal with cancer and if there is some cancer there at the time you give the immune therapy, it's a little bit like it being a vaccine, uh, that there is some, some of the stimulating target is present for the immune cells to recognize and go after. And then if you subsequently remove the cancer, the cells that are left in your system are better at dealing with any small stray bits of it that may have spread to other parts of the body. So this is a, a very interesting new application for immune therapy. And I, I must say the early studies which have been done look really good. And it's just great to see a young Irish yeah. uh, doctor. I, I better, I, I know he'd like me to say Clara man, uh, <laughs> who's, who's been so important in this. Indeed, parenthetically, um, as somebody who came back to Ireland where there were only four of us in the country, they're about 37 or 38 now, which is still far too few. Um, but we have this very unusual demographic in Irish cancer medicine, the great majority of us trained in one of the top five cancer centers in America. There is no country in the world, including America, where 80% of their cancer specialists trained in the top five cancer centers in the world. Uh, it's an amazing demographic. We have an extraordinary cohort of talented young uh, oncologists. Mind you, they all look young to me now. Talented young oncologists. Uh, <laughs> Actually working. getting around to that, yeah, John. That's right, yeah. How old are you? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah, it's hard being 39, isn't it? Yeah, no, I, no, I, I turned, despite my youthful appearance, I turned 66 this year. Okay. Um, and, you know, obviously it's, uh, one gets a certain, you know, uh, time for, a, you know, personal counting of, of one's life and what one has done and what one hopes still to achieve. I mean, there is a an underlying reality in my life. I, I have three wonderful children who are older uh, and, you know, and around the 30 plus range. 
and I have uh, a seven-year-old. Uh, I have a lovely seven-year-old son, so it certainly... Are you crazy? <laughs> no, I, 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 you know, I, my, my four children are the four best things I ever did. I, I, I really believe that. And uh, obviously it's a different experience, you know, uh, you know, becoming a father again in your, in, in your late fifties, as I did. Uh, and it certainly, it certainly makes you perhaps want to not repeat some of the mistakes whereas as a, as a species we're very good at repeating mistakes and I, I certainly had a spectacularly bad work-life balance uh, uh, when my older children were, were children and I'm, I'm sorry for that I mean there were some reasons why it was unavoidable that for reasons we've discussed earlier about you know how few cancer specialists there were and some of it was my own drive too I guess there were just I was full of probably unrealistic ambitions about what I would achieve in the world of cancer research uh, at that stage. Uh, and my perspective is a little different now. And, and as a result, uh, I have recently decided I've retired from the uh, public practice that I had with the HSC. I've had the great privilege of looking after uh, patients and, and the various iterations of the Irish public medicine service for over 35 years, or for about 35 years as a consultant or as a junior doctor. Um, and, you know, I don't regret one bit of it. I, I do find myself at this stage, though, trying to, uh, you become conscious when you're my age and you have a seven-year-old child that you would like to try and make sure you're around for a few years for the child and, and hopefully see him grow up a bit. So I'm, I'm trying to reorganize certain priorities on that. I'm not retiring at all from private practice, uh, and I'm certainly not retiring from research. Uh, Vincent's and UCD have kindly allowed me to continue on a, on a voluntary contracts uh, in the hospital and in the university, which are, you know, unpaid, but which allow me to continue doing research and to be involved in clinical trials uh, in those two institutions. And I also have a very major involvement with Dublin City University, uh, where I hold a, a chair of cancer research and where I'm affiliated with a a wonderful young group of young lab researchers, many of whom I've mentored through the years. We mentioned earlier how my research was really clinical research. I had done some lab research early on, but really over the trajectory of my career, it's been clinical research, you know, trials in patients rather than getting my hands wet in a lab. But funnily, over the last 15 years, that has morphed more in the direction of laboratory research. And while I still am not in any realistic sense a wet hand scientist is going into labs and making observations, my research now is much more focused on interactions between what to ask in the lab as a result of clinical observations. Uh, we're very, for instance, the whole, I'm sorry if I keep going back to the Herceptin story, but one of the early observations we made with Herceptin and another wonderful colleague of mine, Professor Giuseppe Gulo, who worked with me for many years in, in St. Vincent's, um, uh, and I did some research which showed that some patients with overtly secondary breast cancer that, that was HER2 altered, cancers that would have in previous generation been uniformly fatal, that maybe 10 or 12 or maybe more percent of these patients were having such long remissions that they were cured. So this was uh, this was just wonderful. I mean, the thought that we had a little hand in helping to develop a treatment, and we didn't just do do it ourselves, but we identified what I think a lot of people kind of knew already, that as the Herceptin data got better, that some of these patients were getting these spectacular results. So we started a basic multi-year long lab project based in DCU, uh, trying to work out why these patients did better than other patients. And that has produced some really nice research and some very good publications. And my, my colleagues there, I can't not mention Professor Naomi Walsh, Dr. Alex Eustace, and Dennis Collins, uh, who all came to me as very young scientists and are now achieving great prominence as independent scientific researchers. We've been working on that, and we'll continue to work on that. My retirement won't take me away from that work. Um, Can I ask you about the retirement age, actually, because you were there used to be a mandatory six, age of 65 where you had to retire from public practice but that's changed now to 70 years, am I right? Yeah, when I was in the Shannon, I had a big bee in my bonnet about this because I had a particular senior colleague in Vincent's who was somewhat older than me, who one day was doing operations, running a research lab, running a large academic department, teaching students, teaching junior doctors, and bang, the next day was told, that's it, you're finished. And that was all based on one thing, the number on his birth certificate. And I said... Please would somebody explain the logic of this to me. At the time, the country was in terrible trouble economically. And I hope I get this right now, but I, I remember putting together a, 
a little sort of stock in trade phrase, I used to say, how many things are wrong with this sentence? A poor, cash-strapped country that can't afford its own pension and social obligations forces competent, able-bodied people to become dependents on the state against their will at a time when it's impossible to find equally qualified people to replace them. That's actually all one sentence. <laughs> but I mean, how many things were wrong with that? Yeah. I mean, it was just idiotic. Mm. So I introduced legislation when I was in the Senate, one of my many failed legislative attempts. I had one successful one, which we can talk about in a moment, but many failed legislative attempts to end mandatory retirement in the public sector. Now, some people interpreted this as saying, oh, he wants to take away my right to retire. I said, no, but it means that you don't have to retire just because you're 65. You still can retire if you're 65. But, you know, why would you if you want to keep working and you're good at your job? I want to personalize it, but there was one particular specialist in a specialist area of, uh, of, of, of medicine in Ireland. And, and when he retired against his wishes, they just couldn't find anybody to replace him. Mm. Um, so it was a crazy situation. Now, the bill failed because those who were not like I was becoming nerdish students of the arcane details of Irish legislative history, will know that backbench, backbench senators who are independents don't get bills passed. Um, but the government themselves kind of obviously liked the idea more than they let on because they brought in a bill themselves. So they ended mandatory retirement in the public sector at 65 and have extended it to 70, which is a movement in the right direction. And the, the truth is most people by 70 will want to retire. Um but why did I do it? Well, again, as I said, I'm a 66-year-old man with a seven-year-old child, and uh, I just really felt at this stage I'd, I'd kind of, I'd like to re reorganize the rest of my professional life a little bit, uh, and um, uh, that's what I've done. Okay. Yeah, mm. no, it's interesting, and it's important that you do what's right for you and your family as well, I suppose. Can I ask you a little bit, because I did offer you a bun before you came in. And you refused because you said you were an intermittent faster. Is there a reason for that? Um, if I showed you a photograph of what I looked like 22 years ago, you would understand the reason. Uh, I found myself uh, getting into a potentially very bad health situation about 20 years ago. I was very, very heavy. Uh, I had, uh, but I won't control the numbers, but I, I was about 20 kilograms heavier then than I am now. Uh, I was in my early 40s. Uh, and for various reasons, I had a pretty unhealthy lifestyle with lots of late nights at work. I was living alone at the time, and you know, you'd often take the, sh the easy way out and just get a takeaway on the way home or something like that. And I had a wonderful, wonderful patient, uh, Lord Rester, called Anne Burns, who was a young woman with breast cancer who was a triathlete. Uh, and and I'm not giving away any professional secrets. It was all public domain. She was very public about her illness and her wonderful family were so supportive of her and of our, our research. Anne set about doing fundraising for us in cancer research based around her own triathlon activities. So the she started an annual triathlon, which raised money for our charity, the Cancer Clinical Research Trust. Um, and she said to me when she was setting up the first one, look at my large, ample, physique, she said to me, you should do it. And I said, I couldn't do it. She said, well, you should try. And I said, you know, she's right. Uh, and I decided I really needed to lose weight. Uh, and I, intermittent fasting wasn't a thing then. I don't think it had a name, but I just knew that I wasn't good. If I sat down to have a meal in the hospital, I'd eat everything. If somebody brought in a, a tray of sandwiches to a catered meeting, I'd eat them all. Um, the easiest thing for me, I found, was just to make a rule that I would eat nothing until I went home at night time, that I just didn't have breakfast, I didn't have lunch, I just ate once a day. And I did that five days a week, and I threw in a bit of exercise. Uh, I started jogging gently and then running. I was doing five and 10K runs, uh, and I took part in the triathlon. Now, I never actually did the full triathlon with the swim because I didn't trust my swimming ability, but I would join a team where I would do the cycle and I would do the run and for many years that was the routine so i stuck with it over the years um and i'm not advocating it for everyone mm. but there certainly is great interest right now and in the whole question of intermittent fasting it, it causes a whole cascade of positive metabolic effects which can be very good um in terms of dealing with uh, obesity issues and metabolism and sugar issues and things like that and I, again i do always advise patients, I try to take the time to advise patients on the importance of diet for their health. Um, 
I'm not advocating what I do for everybody else. As somebody once said, but doesn't it make you very cranky? And I said, well, how would you tell? You know, <laughs> um, But for me, it has kind of worked. I'm a little heavier now than I'd like to be. Okay. I, I, my weight has crept up a little, but I'm still substantially 20 kilograms lighter than I was. I, I managed to be even eight or nine kilograms lighter than I am now uh, at one okay. stage. Uh, but um, So then at the weekends, do the brakes come off and you just go crazy? Brakes or? come off. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, so five and, and days my, a week. You five it's... days a week. You do it. And my my wife is my wife is wonderful. I mean, she. You know, I would say for three or four of the nights of the week, I would also eat something very very healthy when I do eat at home. But I would have a. There are many. I, I'm not advocating veganism or vegetarianism, but I mean, I'm not, I'm absolutely not. I love meat, but three or four nights of the week, the the meal I would eat would be effectively vegan or certainly vegetarian, uh, and would be based on you know plant foods and things, um, and. I don't run anymore. I'm afraid the uh, one of the ravages of age is my knees aren't up to the running the way they used to be. I do walk to work. I have about a 3.7 kilometer each way walk to St. Vincent's. I would do that three to four days a week. I would walk. Okay. Uh, I do a little bit of gym work as well, but not, not as much as I should. But it's getting onto a very interesting area for us to discuss, which is the whole question of weight and cancer. Yes. Um, I have so many patients who come to me, you know, really, they just cannot understand this tragedy which has befallen them. How do I get cancer? I don't smoke. I was never a big drinker. I keep away from processed foods, blah, blah, blah. You know how it, and, and, you know, cancer is, cancer is mostly bad luck. I mean, there are some things that certainly can tip the odds in your favor of getting it, like smoking is the absolute catastrophic no-no. Anybody who smokes should stop. Anybody who doesn't smoke should not start. Uh, Alcohol is a cancer causer as well. There's, you know, there's been some debate as to whether a small amount of alcohol is safe or not. There's, there are some studies which suggest that really any amount of alcohol gives you a little increase in the risk. Again, people have to make that value judgment on their own. Sunburn is a no-no. Uh, you know, getting your HPV vaccine, all of these things help. But in truth, the two big ones, I think, that will determine on a population level the incidence of cancer the burden of cancer, the expense of cancer, the healthcare requirements of cancer that are modifiable are smoking and uh, weight. Uh, uh, for many of the most common cancers, there is a pretty good correlation between being overweight and an increased risk of getting, getting to cancer. Now, this does not mean that this person got it because they're overweight, or why did this person who was not overweight still get the cancer? It just means that statistically in general, if you're in a heavier group, your chances some percents higher than if you're in a in a more healthy weight group. And on a population level, that can translate into thousands of extra doctors and nurses needed, thousands of extra hospital beds, billions of extra euros in dealing with it. So as a society, as a group of societies, if we do want to do something really big with a big impact to reduce the burden of cancer and other ill health, obviously keep focusing relentlessly on abolishing smoking uh, and on uh, trying to really grapple with the weight issue, which is becoming a big one. And, and paradoxically, the weight issue is becoming a bigger issue uh, for 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 poorer people, uh, which may yeah. well be to do with, uh, uh, number one, the, you know, the cost of healthy food um, and also, uh, you know, education levels can affect it as well. But um, it is something we really have to do something about. So what are your thoughts then on the, the recent anti-obesity medications, the injections like Saxenda and Wagovi, they're horrifically called the skinny jabs, you know, by mm. Hollywood and all these people that are just doing them for, I suppose, for aesthetic reasons rather than for the reasons that they should be used for, mm. which is to try and become a more healthy weight. What are your thoughts on the, the increased prescribing of them? I love the science. I mean, I just think it's it's so wonderful that this great big health problem that we've now seen a big chink in the armor uh, of this big health problem. And, and I, I know some people are going to say, oh, this is crazy. You know, why should we be buying expensive drugs so that people can keep it? It's, the one thing, if you listen to experts in obesity, they will tell you obesity is not like a question of moral failing or you know, it's it's a very, very complex illness. Your 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 body gets programmed to a certain level of, of fat and it's very, very hard through your own efforts sometimes. Even I see people that really struggle with this to get it down. Um, it really is, you know, Biology really is destiny, you know, it really is. Uh, I believe that when, when you look at how did this happen, and it kind of makes sense if you think of evolution, okay? Evolution really wants us to live long enough 
to have babies and to sustain the babies through their early childhood until they can become independent. And it kind of loses interest in us after that. So a lot of the skills that we have based on evolution are skills that enable us to live to, we'll say, young age or early middle age. And of course, for the overwhelming course of our history as a species, there has not been an abundance of food. Mm. There's been cycles of famine and running away from predators and all of this stuff that we would have... Um, a kind of a built-in program that when food is available, you just take it all. And, you know, you have enough on board to sustain you through the next famine period. And that's kind of why we see the obesity problem that we see now. Because for all kinds of other reasons, like good public health, like clean water, like improvements in medicine, like all, you know, all of these things, we're now living past that age. We're living into middle age and we're living into older age. And of course, evolution has not given us the biological skills to deal with that in terms of high cholesterol, sugar, obesity, and all of that stuff. So we are kind of programmed to overeat, mm -hmm. okay? It's, it's deep within us. So it's not something where you can say, this is your fault. And how dare you want me to spend my tax money buying you a drug because you ate too much? It's not like that. So I'm really excited by it. I don't want to get into the specifics of it. There will be side effects that have to be dealt with. There will be, you know, really comprehensive programs based on medication, based on diet, you know, monitoring for side effects, blood sugar, all of these things. But it's just phenomenally exciting as a scientist, as an investigator, that this whole other area of amazing as science is opening up a great potential for right. major improvements in health, and it really could be major. Yeah, no, I just want to say one other thing, you know, yeah. totally free associating here again. I'm <laughs> using this mic. The other great disease that hovered over my early medical days, and people don't forget this now, I, I graduated medicine in 1980. And I remember in about, maybe it was 81 or 82, some early early time when I had an interest in cancer, reading about this new paper about an outbreak of a weird, rare cancer called Kaposi's sarcoma, which was being reported in gay men in, uh, in Los Angeles and in New York. And then, of course, the story rapidly developed to uh, these strange infections that people were getting. And, you know, a lot of head scratching, what was causing this? I mean, this was just this, you know, we weren't used to the idea of a new disease emerging. And, the science of what happened with HIV between then and now is just absolutely phenomenal. I mean, it is really the unsung great modern healthcare research story. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when I used to have patients with AIDS, we used to call it then, who used to all die. You'd see these, you know, otherwise healthy young men who were stricken down, and, and women who were stricken down with the, this illness and the, and the awful ravages that it caused and facing an inevitable death within a few years. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can recall some of the saddest things I ever saw uh, were related to that disease. And within a few short years, about four to five years, there was the first drug. And within about eight to nine years, there were drugs that just revolutionized the whole the whole field so much that, you know, without curing the disease, and by the way, we may cure it yet, but without curing the disease, that patients were able to be restored to really good, you know, near normal life expectancies and, and good health. And it just is, I think, a great model for showing us what can be done, what medicine, what's, what science can do. Science is just so critically important. When I was in the Shannon, again, I tried to get interest in the idea of having mandatory science education for everybody up to the age, up to school leaving age. Now, this was not an attempt to make everybody a scientist. The logic behind my idea was that, you know, science is the language of nature. Like, I mean, everybody learns science. You know, little kids learn that things fall down, they don't fall up. You know, that water is wet, that fire is hot. And you, you, you learn all the basic stuff about science. And an ability to understand the scientific process I think is important for all of us, not just for those of us who want to be white coat nerds, you know, but for, you know, in, in every field of life, people should understand the, the principles of science. Uh, and we need to put science, I think, at the core of, of science as an approach. I don't mean science, the, the establishment of science, but scientific thinking as an approach should be at the core of education because it will help people understand all kinds of issues where public perceptions have been completely at odds 
uh, with science uh, over the years, with the realities of science. I absolutely agree. And if it's mandatory, at least it will give a child that may not have considered it an education in it. And they may well become, you, you know, another scientist of the future, but they're not going to know that unless they take it up and do it because uh, it's not mandatory. So, absolutely. yeah, no, it does make perfect sense. Yeah. Can I ask you what your favourite area of cancer therapy is that you've worked in over the years? I know you your subspecialty is breast cancer and um, chemotherapy as well, but what has been the most exciting area that you have worked in or that you'd you love to do? Well, so I I would have a relatively general oncology practice. I have a special, I would have a very special research focus over the years in breast cancer. I would be, with all due modesty, I'd have a fairly, you know, large list of publications and collaborations in breast cancer. And I, I'm delighted and proud that I've had a small little teeny role in, you know, helping to advance the field of breast cancer treatment. Uh, uh, and uh, that, I guess, is still the, the disease that's closest to my heart, and in particular, secondary breast cancer. The patients where the cancer is spread from the breast, the patients who are, we tend not to think of as being in the cure area, but where we're trying to improve their survival, prolong their survival, improve their quality of life. And I'm pretty pleased to say that, you know, some of them I think are being cured now, within the HER2 positive subgroup, some are. I have actually got quite big hopes that we're going to see some more advances in that field in the years to come. But I must say, the thing that has just taken my imagination in recent years has been the immunotherapy. I mean, okay. and, and the application of immunotherapy to cancers that were... I, I was sitting down recently with a pile of therapy orders uh, to be reviewed and signed, and I remember just going through them and turning to the nursing colleague with me and saying, you know something, um, I think I said it was seven years ago, none of these drugs existed. Yeah. You know, so it's been phenomenal what's happened. And I can tell you, you do get very conscious of the, the really big picture in the world and how how fine a line we all live on. Uh, and when I, I get, I, I grew up in, as I said, in New York, and I, I remember actually the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was five years old. My mother and I had come back to Ireland for a holiday and the Cuban Missile Crisis blew up, and my father wrote to us no emails in those days and said, do not come back. Stay there for, until this thing calms down. And we ended up staying for a few extra months in, in, in Ireland because of this awful fear that there'd be a nuclear war and that New York would be attacked, etc. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that was a, I, I was too young to really appreciate what was going on, but I, I remember that we stayed longer. And I remember I've always had a sort of an interest in politics and geopolitics and military stuff. And I can, you know, recall times of concern in the world, but I can never recall one like now. I, I think this is the most this most frightening situation I can remember in the world. And I, you know, I'm I don't mean to be alarmist about it, I'm, but you just get the sense that the potential for a disaster between the superpowers is always there. It didn't go away with the end of the Cold War, and it seems to have really ramped up to a much higher level now. And when you think of all the times that there were near misses. Mm -hmm. um, there was the famous episode in the 1980s, which wasn't famous at the time because nobody knew about it, when the Soviet, Soviets nearly launched a nuclear attack because there was a glitch in their radar and computer systems, which led them for about a minute to believe that there was an incoming American nuclear missile attack coming into the Soviet Union. And there was one man who was like a mid-level colonel on duty that day. And all the others were saying, Colonel, you must call the Kremlin. You must call the, pick up the red phone, tell them the Americans are attacking. They must authorize a counter strike. And he said, no. He said, I think it's a mistake, which wasn't a really easy thing to say in the Soviet Union then. And he didn't. He stilled his hand. He didn't make the call. And within about two minutes, it became apparent that it was a computer glitch. But it's widely recognized now by students of the Cold War how close we came to disaster then. And, you know, we had a few other near misses since. And we think of the tension now between the Americans and the Chinese, the tension between the Russians over the, you know, their awful invasion of Ukraine. Um, and then you think, on the other hand, what we've achieved in science and medicine, that here we are, 120 years ago, they were putting leeches on people to treat cancer, mm -hmm. you know? And here we can now work out what gene is causing it, like what variation on the gene, nearly down to what atom on the gene is causing it. And in many cases, they have a treatment which can pick it up. We have blood tests which are being developed, which will be able to diagnose cancer from a pinprick of blood, 
and tell you what part of your body it's come from. These extraordinary advances that we've made. And in the blink of an hour, maybe in about 60 minutes, we could all find ourselves back in the Stone Age. And I just really, really hope that the world at large really tries to come to grips uh, with the potential for disaster, uh, which which we increasingly seem to be facing. And I hope that cool heads really do prevail and that the awful... Uh, the awful downside of what could happen if there was another major war. I mean, I'm thinking even now, smugly sitting here in suburban Dublin, what it's like to be in Kiev or someplace, yeah, or know. God knows in Mariupol or someplace like that, uh, and the awfulness that's being rained on those brave people. But there really is a need. We need to we need to make every effort we can to try and get get that war ended. And, and the dichotomy of trying to save lives here with cancer care mm. and cancer research and mm. then just indiscriminately killing people oh. on the other side of the world. It's, it is, yeah. hor- like it's, mm. it's actually unfathomable to even think about it, isn't yeah. it really? Yeah, 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 yeah. You just think of, I always, when I worked in Mount Sinai, I, I encountered a lot of Holocaust survivors. Uh, and you know, you'd have some elderly person coming in for their cancer care and you'd go to examine them and, of the tattoo. I worked in Mount Sinai, I encountered many Holocausts. In fact, indeed, when my father sold his shop in New York, he sold it to two gentlemen who were survivors of the concentration camps, two Jewish men, lovely gentlemen. Uh, and when I was in Mount Sinai, then I encountered many patients who were Holocaust survivors still. This was the 1980s. There were older people now that had survived as either children or young adults. You'd go to examine them and they'd have a tattoo on their left forearm. And you think, you know, how did that happen? Was there something unique about the Germans that made that happen? I, I've, I've always been a real believer in the fact that the Holocaust and the Nazi years were the aberration in Germany. I mean, G- Germany was a highly civilized, cultured country. They had developed socialized healthcare. They had developed the first forward progressive look at old age pensions. I mean, they really were. And I I think the lesson that we should take from it is that even good countries full of good people can go wrong. Bad things can happen. Uh, And I, I always, there were so many, there's a wonderful book uh, the biography of Hitler by Kershaw, who's a British historian. And it always comes to the core of that question that people always ask themselves about Hitler. Was he bad or was he mad? I think the answer is bad. Uh, I think he, he certainly had bizarre aspects to his personality, but I, I it mainly was badness. And there was such incredible bad luck that allowed him to rise to the position he did. There were so many times when shifting coalitions in the German parliament could have worked different ways, where if some people had realized what in fact was happening with this man, that it would have been stopped. Even as late as 1938 and 1939, when the great bulk of the German military establishment did not want to start a war because, well, not because they were pacifists, but because they thought they'd lose it. And it was Hitler who just drove the whole thing along. And it's so extraordinary to me to think that how little bits of bad luck in history can have such catastrophic consequences. And I'm just reminded of that right now. I I, I just think it's, there is such a potential that my seven-year-old will grow up in a world where he might realistically look at a life expectancy of 110 or 120, where we have it within our technological grasp to end famine. Um, to have simply amazing advances in what information technology can do in terms of what biology can do. But yet, he could find himself living in a in a, a barren landscape if the wrong decisions are Grappling made. Grappling around yeah. for food. Yeah, you know? It is crazy, isn't mm. it? Mm. Oh, goodness. How do I bring you back to your breast cancer care? I wanted to ask you why breast cancer or secondary breast cancer was 
of specific interest to you? Was there a certain turning point or a certain patient that you met that was just like, actually, this is something that I'd like to do a little bit more of? Or no, I, in truth, I mean, I was always very conscious of the tragedy of breast cancer, uh, and and you know, especially when it affected young people. I mean, it was always one of those things that did, did motivate you. But the reality is, the true reasons that I got focused on breast cancer. One was Dr. Larry Norton, who I mentioned in earlier on, who had been a boss of mine in Mount Sinai, and when he came to Sloan Kettering and started the new breast cancer program, he's just a very inspirational figure and he had great ideas and I had, an, I had an interest in trying to improve on chemotherapy treatments and that and breast cancer was a good mix at the time. And, and the other reason was basically the whole, the fact that breast cancer was a bit sensitive to chemotherapy, that you could take somebody with advanced bad breast cancer, looked like they were close to death and give them treatment, which might bring them back from the edge of the abyss. They could live for six months, a year, two years, sometimes, sometimes occasionally for, for many years. And just this challenge of, Maybe if we could make the chemotherapy better, more patients will achieve that and maybe we'll cure some patients. And that is in truth what originally turned me on to breast cancer was I thought it was perhaps an appropriate target for things that I felt maybe I was I was good at. Okay. And uh and from that then I developed and of course then my involvement with Dr. Slayman and Herceptin gave me an interest in the newer approaches to breast cancer treatment using the targeted therapies, et cetera. So it's it's been a work in progress for many years. I've still my passion. And the average patient that we see now with secondary breast cancer, now their survival is measured in years rather than months. Sadly, the average patient will still die from the disease, but it's not at all uncommon now for patients to get five, six, seven years. I lost one lady recently who was going for nearly 20 years from the diagnosis of secondary breast cancer. I saw a patient two days ago who had a biopsies of her liver 12 years ago showing secondary breast cancer who's still alive Okay. Uh, and still, you know, on active treatment and doing okay. So it's it's been it's been gratifying to see the improvements, but challenging to know how far we still have to go. Which brings me on to the next question. Being a doctor in the field where you are seeing people and many of them will you, you may be able to prolong their life, but they will maybe die. How do you turn off your emotions, I suppose, when you're dealing with these people? Is it very clinical? Is it like I'm dealing with this person, I'm going to do the best that I can for them and I'm not going to get involved? Or has there been times in your life where you've been become involved with a patient or you've had a special affinity to someone and it's just, you know, it's been very difficult to deal with the fact that you may not be able to help them on their cancer? It's not just me. I have wonderful colleagues and, you know, even in St. Vincent's, I've got two fabulous, two fabulous uh oncology colleagues who specialize in breast cancer, Professor Higgins and Professor Janice Walsh. Uh, so, you know, we're dealing all the time with people getting bad news about breast cancer and, and, and other cancers. I mean, I, I remember saying once that, you know, probably nearly a couple of times a week, we end up giving some person a, a, the worst news or amongst the worst news they're ever likely to hear in their life. Uh, and you do see all the tragedies. You see the we all remember the young mothers. We all remember the the women who were the, the the children of living mothers and fathers, and how sad that is to deal with. I mean, that that never gets easy. Uh, it never does. And I don't think we ever depersonalize from it. You you do have to develop a a personal skill set to live the other parts of your life where you're not you know not dealing with tragedy all the time. Are there still moments when you wake up in the middle of the night and wonder? And you think about things, yeah, yeah, it does happen sometimes. Yeah, yeah. goodness, I know. I, I, I've often wondered that, mm. and thanks for answering in mm. the way that you have. Mm. Can I ask you a little bit about the new consultant's contract and what do you think about that? This is part of a bigger question about reforming the health system. Uh, I actually, then, can I just come in with instead of that question? Because you may be answering it in the mm. in the way. What if you could make three changes tomorrow to the healthcare system that we have currently, or one change even, if you were made Minister for Health overnight or whatever higher power you need to be made to actually make it, what would you do? I'd only need to make one change. I wouldn't make three. Okay. Uh, and the one change I would make would be to bring in German or possibly Canadian style universal social insurance based uh, healthcare. So this is where I could get into the outer realms of 
economical nerdiness. So I'll try not to. <laughs> but in general... I can take it, John. I can yeah. take it. In general, think of three ways of financing and organizing healthcare. One is the... Uh, you know, brutalist Darwinian way based on if you have money, you get healthcare, and if you don't, you don't. Okay, nobody wants that. The other way is, at the other extreme, is what is called the beverage model of healthcare, uh, named after Beveridge, who was a, a, a politician from the 1930s and 40s in the UK, was one of the fathers of the British welfare state. And the beverage model basically says the government should just run it. We just completely socialize it. All the healthcare workers become employees of the government. Uh, everybody is paid a salary. Everything is reimbursed in accordance with a budget. And the money ultimately is generated by general taxation revenues. And that's not a bad model. It works in some ways. It's it's <clears throat> it's very good for bringing a certain level of healthcare to large chunks of the population. Uh, the third model is the one that I think is the best, which is the model of social insurance, which is where... There is, everybody has to pay insurance. The amount of insurance you pay depends on your income. If you make a lot of money like me, you pay more than somebody who has a small income. Uh, it's not a fixed premium, it's a fixed percentage of your income, the way the Germans tend to do this. Um, and at the end of that, you have a product, which is pretty much the same for everybody. The, you know, the hospital consultant who's paying a very large amount of money for her or his insurance gets the very same product as the, you know, the worker who's on a fixed salary, a small fixed salary, and is paying a smaller amount. But in the end, everybody has an insurance instrument, which they can take. And they can take it to a public hospital. They can take it to a private hospital. They can take it to a university hospital. They can take it to a charity hospital. They can take it wherever they want. Okay. And that, there were little wrinkles in the way the German system works, but that's basically kind of how it works in Germany. Um, and the doctors, in turn, get paid in different ways. Some of them will elect to work in hospitals where they're paid a fixed salary. Okay, Some of them will not. They will elect to work in accordance with reimbursement by, if they perform a service for the insurance patient, the insured patient, the insurance company will pay the doctor. Now, there are pluses and minuses all the way around this. In general, if you pay doctors to do things, things get done. And you won't have waiting lists. Systems that have that kind of reimbursement don't have long waiting lists. Systems, on the other hand, where you pay people a fixed salary and say, this is what you have. This is your salary. You get the same check every month. If you operate on 10 patients or 100 patients, the salary is the same. And I'm not trying to be negative about my colleagues who are in systems like that, but whatever the reason is, they tend to have waiting lists. Somebody once famously looked at the Irish system, which is a mixture of public and private, and said... Imagine it's a great big bar with a lounge, okay? And in the bar, the barmen are on a fixed salary. And in the lounge, you get the barman gets paid for every drink he serves. Where do you think you'll get your drink served faster? You know? Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit like that. The problem of the reimbursement by activity system is that doctors might price gouge and start doing things which are unnecessary, a thing called supplier-induced demand, where a doctor gets paid money for giving chemotherapy, will say, you need chemotherapy, even the even if the indication for it might be more modest. Now, I like to think that our ethics prevents us from doing that, and I also like to think that there are ways of policing that, and there are ways of introducing standards about what is and isn't an appropriate treatment. And if you deviate from those standards, you have to answer your harsh questions about it. But those systems do tend to have very short waiting lists. They're a little more expensive. They tend to work better. So if you imagine a system, and, and you know, this isn't pie in the sky, by the way. This is basically what the VHI already does for about 40, 35 or 40% of the Irish population, okay? Mm -hmm. there, there is a, it's a, the, 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 the premium model is a bit different in that the premium is, is, is a fixed premium, not based on your income. But if you tweaked it, that you paid more for your VHI, if you made more, you paid less if you made less. And by the way, if you make no money, you get it for free. People like me pay a little bit more for ours so that people that are unemployed or unwaged, I should say, that they get the same cover. So it's almost like a tax... Which are it's like a tax, but it, it doesn't disappear into general revenue. It, it, it's used specifically for the benefit of, of the insured patients. The Canadians have this, the Germans have it on a multiplicity of insurance schemes, some of which are public, some of which are private, some of which are based, if you work for a very big company, it may be based on like BMW or, or Siemens or something like that. Um, 
And, and in others, it is based on private for profit insurances, and others are not for profit like VHI. But the advantages of it are that, the, the, well, if you look at the disadvantages of the Irish system, the Irish system is very unequal. I mean, there's a real big difference in the quality of the service you get in the public and private systems. And I'm not, I'm not saying all public patients are all dying, but it's not like that. But in terms of how long you have to wait for things, how long you be going along with your bad hip before you get fixed, how long you're waiting for your cataracts to be fixed, how long you're waiting for the CAT scan, all of these things. And, and in some areas where there's an impact on life expectancy, it's bad too. Um, it's also very inefficient. There's a huge amount of wastage in the Irish system. Uh, um, and it is a generally, I, I say this, and I'll take criticism for saying this, Irish healthcare in general is of mediocre quality. This does not mean that we don't have wonderful nurses, physios, pharmacists, doctors, very you know diligent and dedicated hospital administrators and managers, not for that reason. But in a system where you are waiting two, three, four, or five years to see someone, even if the person you see is a fabulous specialist in that area, best in the world, will give you the best care in the world, if you have to wait years to see them, that's a low quality system. And I can tell you that in Dublin, even in the better quote unquote university hospitals, people can be waiting many months for consultations, for scans, for results and things like this. And you may well get the best scan in the world read by the best radiologist and be seen by the best doctors and treated by the best nurses. But if you have to wait months to access that system, okay, that is not a high quality system. That is strictly mediocre. And that's why I'd say the system is mediocre. It's also mediocre in that too much of our care, less than before, is delivered by trainee doctors and not enough by fully trained specialists because there are too few fully trained specialists. So the thing which would fix, I believe, most of these things or go a long way towards fixing them is a model where everybody has the same type of insurance. It may not necessarily be the same company, by the way. The Israelis have four competing public insurance, social insurance companies that compete with one another and keep one another on their toes. And they give a really good product to Israeli citizens in terms of, of healthcare in that country. Um, uh, in Canada, it's a single payer system. There is a single provincial insurer for every province. But, you know, people talk about the new consultant's contract here and having a national contract. There is no national contract for doctors in Canada. I mean, they have different contracts in different places. And uh, most of them have some level of contracting with the, their provincial insurance company. I have friends who work in leading teaching institutions and in university hospitals in parts of Canada, but their reimbursement is based either individually or as part of the practice group they're in and their academic group on the reimbursement that the insurance company pays the doctor or pays the group of doctors for the service they provide. If you treat more patients, the group gets more money. If you treat fewer patients, the group gets less money. Within the group, they may divvy it up in different ways depending on clinical versus research responsibilities, which I think is a good idea. But in general, if the group isn't active, the group doesn't get paid. So everyone's keeping everyone else on their toes yes. in that sense. And uh, and it's single tier, you know? Yeah. Germany is a little bit multi-tiered in the sense that some people will elect to go to a private hospital uh, where they might have better hotel accommodation or better whatever. And they may pay a bit more for special insurance product, which gives them that. Um, they may also pay for having a more guaranteed exclusive access to a particular doctor doing their care as opposed to being in a, a public hospital where a team of doctors might do it. But in general, waiting times are similar for people with ultimately private insurance and those that have the more socialized forms of insurance and the model works well. Interesting, we were talking about Germany. How did it arise? Bismarck, who we think of as like the great, you know, militaristic Prussian, you know, uh, prime minister, chancellor, he was the one who introduced many of the most durable forms of progressive social policy and social health insurance. When he introduced the old age pension, we talked about pensions, we talk, when he introduced the old age pension and, re, and optional retirement at 65 in Germany, the average age that a German died was in their 40s because so many people died in childhood in those days. If you were still alive at 65, on average, you lived two more years. Now, the average age of death for people in Ireland is way up in the high 70s. And if you're still alive at 65, chances are you will live into your 80s. Uh, so those are, those are the changes. But he also introduced a very durable system of social medical care based on this principle of social insurance, which survived the First World War, the Great Depression, 
the Nazis, the Second World War, the Cold War, the division of Germany, the reunification of Germany, all of these things, the system is still there. And it's still there because it works. Uh, and I think How it's will the, it work, though, in the future when there's more older people than younger people, which is the trend in a lot of these countries? Well, that's, that's the, that, that, is a, that, that problem is not specific to a type of reimbursement. I mean, in, in general, I mean, I think inevitably what is going to happen is that our concepts of retirement age will evolve. I mean, if people are living longer and living healthier, I suspect they will be expected to work longer. Now, I'm not saying I'm advocating that, but I suspect that there is a reality that if, if we do reach a stage where people are living and living well, but, you know, limber joints and good lungs and, you know, going to the gym and playing golf and exercise tolerance and doing all these things into their 70s, that it, it will be more difficult for a smaller number of, of pension payers to pay the pot which will look after them as, as they get older. And I, I suspect, I mean, we're seeing, I think we're seeing riots in the streets of Paris as we talk today mm. on, on this very issue about, you know, pushing back the retirement age a little bit. So it, it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. They're great in France for that, aren't they? They don't mm. they don't like anything to affect the way they, they their work-life balance in any yes, way. Yes, I, I always love that. They said the most French headline of all time was, Outrage in France as national philosophy exam disrupted by truck driver strike. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so the current consultant's contract kind of feeds into that a little bit. Your, you, so your thoughts on that is that it's not excellent. It's not a well thought out. Uh, well, plan. you know, so people show he would say that, wouldn't he? Well, no, because I'm retired. I'm not going to be on it. I, I didn't, when they brought in the new contracts eight or 10 years ago, I didn't take them. I stood on the original contract I was ever on. I think the new contract will not fix anything. I think the idea that all of the problems in the Irish, and this is the panacea thinking that you get from the Department of Health. They've been obsessed with consultants' contracts for years. The only problem that a new contract that makes all hospital consultants work exclusively for the government will solve is the problem of not all consultants working exclusively for the government. So if you think the only problem you need to fix is to make sure that all the younger doctors that are not yet retired like me, all the younger doctors are working for the government, yeah, great, make them all work for the government. But if, however, you think that the problem is waiting lists, access to care, shortage of doctors, recruitment difficulties, it will fix none of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. No, absolutely. Mm. Before we finish up, and I ask you the two questions that I always ask every guest, which I know that you didn't even read because you're, you told me you didn't do your homework, but they're okay. I know you'll be able to answer I've had, them. I've had teachers wagging their fingers at me for not doing my homework <laughs> since I was seven. So why should I change? You're it obviously one of these people that just absorbs absorbs information. Mm. Uh, what are your thoughts on the likes of complementary therapies for cancer, things like reflexology and aromatherapy and mm. those kind of things? I, I, I don't believe that there is a parallel reality of physiology uh, about the body. And I don't, I mean, if the principle of reflexology is that there are parts of your feet which are connected to your lung or to your heart or to your pancreas, I, I don't believe that. However, it can be extremely nice and relaxing to have your feet rubbed. And if, you know, people that are going through, you know, difficult times in their life, you know, with cancer and with the awful side effects we sometimes give them from cancer treatment, if they get, you know, comfort and relaxation from, you know, what is called reflexology, I, I would not stand in the way of it. I get, I get very nervous about some interpretations of alternative medicine, though, where people think that it is truly an alternative to taking conventional medicine. I think most of the quote unquote complementary therapists now do understand that it's dangerous to give advice to people not to take the standard therapies. Um, but you still will, I mean, there still are quacks and charlatans out there, uh, you know, who who will tell you things like, you know, this treatment that the doctor has ordered for you, that it won't work and it will only poison you and you should do this instead. And I, you know, yes. I'd be very, very anti that, yeah. John, can you talk to me about your time in the Shannon because you went in there probably bright eyed and bushy tailed with thoughts of how you could improve and possibly reform our healthcare That's service right. and I suspect came out maybe a little bit disappointed. Mm, yeah, crestfallen might be the word rather okay. than a little disappointed. Okay. I mean, I'd, I'd become, uh, as soon as I came back to Ireland and saw the awful deficiencies in the cancer services, I pretty quickly, after a first year of trying to work within 
tra- channels of communication to the Department of Health, I quickly gave up and said, this isn't working. This needs to become an, a subject of vigorous public debate. So I became quite prominent in advocating, in pointing out the deficiencies in the cancer services and advocating for reform uh, to the point where I, I, I know I, I really... I, I developed a very negative relationship with the Department of Health as a result. And, you know, signs on, I've never, ever been involved or invited to be involved in any kind of leadership position in the Department of Health to do with cancer, which is fine. Um, but the, the penny did drop and po- politicians started picking up on it, especially opposition politicians and then people who were coming into government, uh, that there were awful holes in the cancer services and indeed in the health services in general. Michael Noonan deserves more credit than he gets uh, for for his role in improving cancer services it was during his time as Minister for Health. Now, I would, I would have had great disagreements with him on other things, but during his time as Minister for Health, he did a, he really was responsible for identifying that there were huge problems, and he said about making sure that new specialists were appointed in cancer care, something which gets forgotten. Uh, and he, I, we became, you know, relatively friendly during my time in the Shannon. And I used to joke with him that he had slightly plagiarized a speech of mine in which I'd once said there were hospitals in the country I wouldn't let a relative of mine go to if they had cancer. And Michael, when he became Minister for Health, uh, was one of the first things he said in his inaugural speech. And to his credit, he did make sure more people were appointed. But my problems with the health service became more general than just focused on cancer. It dawned on me that the system in general was really needed reform. I went back to college uh, in my 40s and did an MBA in healthcare. uh, And I studied health policy. And that's where I began to learn about things like the German health system, the Canadian system, etc. And I became a big advocate. And indeed, some of the political parties had been speaking at their meetings uh, about the need to reform the health service. And when Fine Gael and Labour coming up to the 2011 election, put together a fairly a fairly uh, joint program on how they would reform the health service. I said, this is it. At the time, the economy had tanked. Fianna Fáil clearly were going out of government at that stage. These people were coming in, and I thought, this will be the opportunity, as as, as uh, the famous American politician Ram Emanuel said, never waste a good crisis. I thought, you know, maybe this will be the time to reform the health service. So they were elected. I was elected to the Shannad. And I thought, I'm not a member of a party, but I'll be in the Shannad. I can speak. I can advocate. Hopefully, I can highlight areas where they can try and advance this agenda of healthcare reform. But of course, within about a millisecond of getting into government, um, uh, they welched. They said, we can't do it. We'll do it after the next election. And I said, you can't do that. I mean, look, you made a promise. You were elected on the promise of reforming the health system. You can't say, elect us again, and maybe we'll do it then. So the whole idea died. They were going to abolish the HSE. They were going to bring in universal insurance. It just it died. And the reason it died, in fact, in, I'm still trying to write a book on this. The reason it died uh, was that the uh, Department of Public Expenditure uh, and Reform um, just thought it was going to be too costly. And I think with great respect to them, they just didn't get it. They were wrong. It wouldn't have been too costly. It would have actually been very cost efficient in the long term. There would have been a bit of a hump for a year or two making it happen, but it would have worked. So anyway, I did focus on doing other things when I was in there. I introduced a number of bits of legislation. Now, what you have to understand is if you're a backbench independent senator, any legislation you introduce will be defeated. There have only been a handful of laws and I think there possibly were both by the late great Fergal Quinn, uh, uh, where a backbench independent senator introduced, you know, usually pretty technical bills in their area of expertise, which which passed. So I introduced a few bills. One was on mandatory retirement, which to try and end mandatory retirement, which failed. Uh, Another one was on reform of the Shannon. When I made my acceptance speech when I was elected to the Shannon, I said, I, I won't ever run for this again unless they reform it. Uh, and in fact, I had a fairly prominent role in the Shannon abolition referendum, which was defeated at the time. And I, I had, I believe, some input into making that happen. I had, you know, a number of public statements on television and otherwise. Um, but I int- introduced a, a notion of Shannon reform, which I thought was doable within the existing constitution, but which would have given every citizen in the country an opportunity to vote in the Shannon election as well as in the Doyle election. That was thrown out. Uh, and I believe Shannon reform is absolutely on the bottom of the list of priorities for any mm-hmm. government. They they tried to abolish it. It failed. And they just can't grapple with it at all. So we're left with this very, in many ways, undemocratic body in, in Shannon Aaron, uh, 
to which nearly very few citizens have a vote. Yeah. Uh, but which I think could be a lot better. I think it has had a role, but it could be better. But the one legislation I did introduce, which was sort of passed, they completely watered it down and changed it. But the thrust of the legislation was passed was one which would have made it illegal to smoke in a car if children were present in the car. Now, uh, this was the first, I believe, national legislation of its type that was introduced. Others have, have done it since. I think Malta may have had something similar. But uh, it, it just stemmed from the observation which was made that there really was no safe way of smoking in a car with a child present, that the, the secondhand smoke within a car is very, very high. And this bill did pass. Uh, whether that justified my five years in the Shannard or not, I don't know. I spent a huge amount of time regularly, nearly on a daily basis, headlining the daily deficiencies and horror stories in the health service in terms of waiting lists and waiting times. I particularly focused on things like the waiting time for obesity surgery, uh, which was seven years at the time for treatment, which really works, which saves lives and which saves money with the health service if it's done. I pointed out the great deficiencies in the rehabilitation services, the shortage of physiotherapists, the poor treatment of nurses. I, I went through all the, the usual list of, of health service deficiencies. But of course, it could be argued that from my own personal point of view, the most important thing that happened was when I was during my time in Shannon Air and I met my lovely wife, Orla, uh, and we became engaged and married and, and now have my uh, lovely uh, seven-year-old uh, son, James. That is... So love can blossom and even the, exactly. even the Senate. Exactly. <laughs> and as well as your seven-year-old, uh, James, you also have three other children. Mm -hmm. And am I right that one of them is, is also in healthcare? Well, yes. Uh, my my daughter, Mia Crown, graduated from UCD Nursing School. So she is now a third generation nurse. Her mother... Uh, her grandmother, my mother, uh, were nurses, and indeed, she would have had six grand aunts who were nurses. So I'm really proud of her keeping up that great tradition. She's a, a wonderful person. Uh, my other two older children are my son uh, Jack, who's uh, living, who's officially John. I mean, I'm pretty tall at about six foot four and three quarters, and I have a very unusual name in John Crown. I can't even be the tallest person called John Crown in Ireland. My son, <laughs> John Jr. Jack, is taller than me. He's about six foot seven. He's Oh my uh, goodness, that's massive. He is. He's a, he's a gorgeous kid, lovely kid. He's in, uh, he's in New York where uh, he is uh, about to open a bar and restaurant. So we're wishing him all the best for that. Fabulous. Maybe you'll maybe do a live podcast from the maybe, red carpet when we open maybe it. Maybe I will. Uh, and um, my... Uh, my older daughter, Katie, uh, uh, my firstborn, who I love very dearly, is involved in the television business. Uh, okay. So they've they've had they've interesting curricula vitae. They three do. children. James yeah. James, however, has assured me that he most of his early life he wanted to be a farmer, uh, specifically a dairy farmer. But now he's actually decided he wants to play for Liverpool. Oh, that's <laughs> just like just like most young little yes, fellas. Yes, but I'm, yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. So, so, so James could still potentially follow you into the field of medicine. Would you? Would you actually? An interesting question. Would you encourage, or would you have ha encouraged your older children, or would you encourage young James to follow in your footsteps, or do you think the life of a doctor is a difficult one? A couple of different questions involved in that. So, in the first instance, the answer one would, of course, always give one's children is you should do what you want to do. Uh, you know, within realistic limits about what your abilities are. You know, you should. You know, you you are unlikely to. You know, become a professional footballer unless you're kind of good at football you know and things <laughs> I've, I haven't quite broken that news to James yet <laughs> but in general I would say you find something that you love and you're interested in and you you go with it the more general question is what I if somebody comes to me and says I'm thinking of doing medicine I'd say do it I think it's the best thing you can do um, uh, I think we will always need we'll always need doctors we'll always need healthcare professionals I think the way we practice medicine is going to change dramatically. Not in a million years, but in the next 10 years because of information technology and artificial intelligence is going to be a colossal change. Uh, an awful lot of what we do will be, because it's cheaper, will be will be automated to an extent. A lot of the advice-based uh, uh, treatments uh, and interventions which are made, I think, will be delivered by 
various other levels of healthcare professionals following, you know, algorithmic guidelines. Um, I, I think the big driver for that kind of reform in healthcare will be cost, because it will. It, it's healthcare is one of those things where the person who's giving it and the person who's getting it are, are depending on a third person to pay for it, and that third person is some kind of an insurance company or government. So they have obviously got a powerful interest in getting value for their money. So I can just we could do a whole other podcast on the future of medicine, but I, I think there will be colossal changes based on that. But I still think if you must love it. Don't do it for bad reasons, unless you actually think it's going to be interesting and just a gorgeous thing to do. This extraordinary privilege that you get of people inviting you into their life to try and deal with problems they have uh, is something which is to be really cherished and to be really grateful for. Uh, it's also very interesting. Uh, in general, it's generally it's a well-paid job, although if you're a very, very smart kid, uh, but the world at your feet academically in terms of things you can do and you just want to make money, you should probably pick something else. You should probably go into some kind of business or finance or something like that. But if you love it, do it. So, John, what advice would you give young people today? Well, I mean, the cliched obvious one is never send that angry email until you think about it overnight. Uh, the second one I would say is really make sure you get sh your family life to the rest of life, which for many people is work-life balance, try and get that right. Uh, I'm no one to preach about that. I've got that one spectacularly wrong on multiple occasions, but it really is very important. I mean, uh, I remember somebody telling me a very cliched phrase once, which was when you're on your deathbed, um, you know, you're you're much more likely to be concerned about how things have gone with your family or your children, if you have them, than you are about, you know, what were the sales in the final quarter of when you were working with the company? Or did you write that extra paper? Uh, and also, this is a hard one. Really enjoy your youth. Really enjoy your youth. Um, but every now and then, stop and remember it doesn't last forever. And that there will be a much longer part of your life, but it won't be like this and try and have some little psychological, familial, relationship-wise preparation for that part of your life too, because it's likely to be a, a longer part of your life than the part you would think of right now as your youth. Yeah, that's very fair, actually. Mm. And then my last question is, what is the meaning of life? Well, uh, I mean, th does anybody know the meaning of life? I mean, people that have high levels of religious certainty would tell you that that life as we know it is just some type of temporary prelude to, you know, an afterlife, you know, which may involve eternity of, of various outcomes. I, you know, I, I have an open mind on that, I, I, I must say. Um, I had a very intensely religious upbringing and it was indeed very religious myself, I guess. I'd have a I wouldn't describe myself as an atheist. I, I mean, I, I think it's possible that there is a God and that there are there is a parallel spirituality that we don't know about. I'm, I don't see the evidence for it. I would have the, I think if you look at most science oriented people, the correct intellectual position is agnosticism, which is, I don't know, prove it. Um, but assuming that there isn't anything else, what's the meaning of the life we have? I think the best we can do is to, try and leave it a little better than we found it to hope that when we weigh up all of the, the bad things we've done and the good things we've done, that the, the ledger comes out in the positive side. I always marvel when I meet older people, and I guess I'm one myself who are interviewed in interviews like this, who say, oh, I've had a long life. I have no regrets. I'm full of regrets. And I don't know how people can say that they have none. I have loads of them. There's a lot of things I would do differently now, but I'll let others to judge if the ledger is positive or negative. <laughs> I'm sure it's mostly positive. John, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very Laura. much. Yeah.